Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the birthday edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Why is it the birthday edition? Because it's my birthday, and I'm working, and I ain't real happy about it. And as a result, some people's feelings may get hurt today. And joining me on this fateful journey, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. When he was born, the doctor spanked his mother, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Happy birthday. Anecdotally, I'm a musician. Just... Looking to buck the trend, go against the grain, just throw my hair in the air, just rent a car and not return it. Go crazy, steal money. Well, Colin, why don't you throw your hair in the air and then follow it with your head, because I just don't care. Happy birthday. You know, <laughs> great Brian Last, you and Colin Thompson are, are merging onto the same list with me today. Because you, you, I, how many years ago was it that I swore that I vowed that I made a mandate to myself that I was not going to work on my birthday anymore? And here we are, the sun's barely come up on September the 17th, and I'm sitting in front of this microphone talking to, I love the people, the cult of Cornette. But did we have to do this particularly right now? You had, you had a little rendezvous with a Russian girl named Hannah. And as a result, we're doing this on my birthday. Are we still how, doing, how was your little... Are we still doing that bad joke? Yeah, it was Rosh Hashanah, one of the uh, holiest days that he won, the high holy days. Of course, Yom Kippur is coming up, and it was good. I enjoy it every year. I enjoy the uh, traditions. And I did not force you to do anything today. Well, we can't leave the people dangling. This is Jim Cornette experience number 500. And there's always tomorrow. I got plumbers coming tomorrow. <laughs> plumbers? Oh, plumbers. I see. I see. Fixing them leaks. The White House plumbers, baby. No, I got, I got, I got water softeners to be installed. Uh, you know, I'm changing everything. I've changed everything here at the castle. Over the past couple of years now, I've replaced all the air conditioners, all the furnaces, the water heaters. I put the, uh, now we're getting the water softeners in. I've had the breaker boxes redone, so we got more more power, Captain. What do you mean water softeners? Like, I know there's water softener tablets. Like, I get those, and I use those. What do you mean, water what do, softeners? What do you do with a, with a tablet? You put them in the big tub. What big tub? There's a big tub for the water softener. That's what I'm having replaced. The tub itself? The big water softener. What do, you, what do you think? You're just putting salt in this fucking bucket that just came with the no. house and it's going to be there forever? No, the salt is the water softener. Those tablets are the water softener. The tub is just the container that facilitates the water softening action. I don't know what you're talking about, but I've got at each end of the house alongside of my water heaters. And the reason why they're at each end of the house is because, of course, of all the remodeling and additions and everything that we've done over a period of time. You, you've got the, you got the water softener, and, you, and it's the tank, and you put the, the salt pellets or, or bags of salt, you dump it in the tank, and boom, and it softens your water. If you got the hard water, you take a shower, it'll knock you out. You'll see stars as soon as that shit hits your scalp. That's not the way You got to soften works. that water up. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, well, I'll tell you what, I've never once been knocked out in my own home by taking a shower, I'll have you know, because I got these water softeners. So that proves my point. This was all new to me a few years ago. They were like, you know, you're going to have to get water softeners. I'm like, excuse me? What are you talking about? Soft water. Well, the water's hard. What do you even... I had no idea what any of this meant. Oh, it's got all the chemicals and all the sediments and all the lead poisoning. And all the, the filth and decay of our urban civilization that's funneled into our groundwater and then recirculated to us. No wonder we're all dying at an early age, grasping for air, with lesions all over our bodies, laying in the fucking street with people kicking us and stepping all over us. Jesus. It's because of the water. People don't have enough water softeners. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's happening so i got plumbers tomorrow so we, we we came down to this is what i'm saying on my birthday 62 years old i'll be at at 10 40 p.m eastern standard time tonight that is i will officially turn 62 
My mother always said that that I I like to stay up late even at an early age. What are you saying? What do you think of people that like stay up and as soon as it's midnight, they're like, it's my birthday. Do you think it should be the minute you're born or should it be as soon as the day turns? Well, no, well, for what purposes? Now, see, if you're just trying to be chronologically accurate, it should be the moment that you first popped out and and made your presence felt in the in the in the world and and it, your your mother then had had suddenly expelled a giant parasite she'd been carrying around for 9 months <laughs> then that would be the exact minute but if you're going for oh I'm going to have a birthday party or it's okay for somebody to wish me a happy birthday something that shouldn't be you know, measured by the, you know, uh, International Fecal Standards Committee in Zurich, Switzerland, or whatever, then the, the date will suffice, except if you're one of these people that gets fucked on the leap year. I'm not talking about actually fucked on leap year. That's most of the AEW fans. I'm talking about fucked out of your birthday because you were born on February 29th. So then in that case, you're going to have to decide on the 28th or March 1st, or elsewise you get shorted a lot of cake and a lot of presents over the course of your lifetime. What was the question? This is a real happy and cheery edition of the drive through Well, Let's I'm see. just telling you, you're having me on the air here today. You're going to get what you're going to get. We're going to talk about where I've been at various points when I've had to work on my birthday. I'll have you know later right. on in this program. This is the happy talk portion oh, of the happy <laughs> birthday episode. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we get the cheerfulness out of the way early so we can get down to shucking this corn right down to the cob but i i will have you know i had a nice time last night i'm still picking the food out of my teeth as a matter of fact last night on a saturday night which i don't get listen to elton john anymore they they ruined that but uh <laughs> no my, come on for my pre-birth no i'm i'm talking about on saturday night at eight o'clock, we watched oh. Spinguli. I'll have you know, I thought, jumping ahead in my narrative here. I thought you meant you were taking it out on Sir Elton that CM Punk was fired. You're never going <laughs> to oh listen to his music God. again. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you, he could have fucking put in a complaint. He's like, "Hey, you licensed my song. You got to have my fucking guy." Anyway, for my pre-birthday dinner, I'll have you know that I, I, got in the kitchen. And prepared for Stacy and myself, not for Harley. She can't eat this kind of spicy food, but she's got her appetite back. She had uh, a, a broiled plain chicken breast and some carrots. But I prepared a New York strips and sea scallops, big as billiard balls. I got the good ones. Then I've got my special recipe where I mix up the Andes fish breading along with the seasoned panko breadcrumbs and drop them in a deep fryer for five minutes. And oh my God, they're pea picking good. I'll tell you what, your lips will smack your brains out. And the New York strip was about two inches thick and boom and, and, and baked potato and a baked sweet potato for Stace. And, and Harley had a little sweet potato too. She likes those. She's a very, a, a very vegetarian oriented puppy. And then we sat down. A very vegetarian-oriented She puppy. likes the vegetables. She likes the little baby peppers. She likes the carrots. She likes the the uh, uh, the sweet potatoes. But you can't be veg. You're either a vegetarian or you're not. not well, she likes she, vegetables. She's, she, she likes vegetables. She's very vegetable-oriented then. <laughs> or she, I don't know. You know, she could be a vegetarian or and she's just eating the chicken to be polite. I don't know. She seems to like it. Who are you to deprive my dog of a decent meal? I'm not trying to deprive her of a decent meal. Well, getting back to my decent meal, after we finished that, and by the way, and Stace got me the traditional birthday cake. There's a place over here, Brian, called Nothing Bunt Cakes, and you'll never guess what they sell. Hopefully good bunt cakes. Bunt, the best bunt cake that your butt has ever witnessed and ever tasted. I don't know, how did, did your butt taste cake very well to begin with? But, or, or sea cake, for that matter. Let but me ask him. <laughs> nothing bunt cakes, and I got a big bunt cake with the big dollops of this, oh my God, this icing, it'll just, it'll make you dizzy as soon as you take a bite of it. There's so much sugar in it. And it's just, it's so creamy and mm, 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 mm. 
But anyway, and sat down and watched Svengoolie, our old friend Svengoolie, because Mr. Sardonicus was on. And, uh, and then that was my pre-birthday evening, since I knew I was going to be subjected to speaking to you here earlier today. So I was trying to find my enjoyment where I could. Do you think happy birthday should be in the public domain? The song. Well, how old are those women now? You know they're from Louisville, Kentucky, don't you? No, I do not know the women behind it or where they're from. No, tell me about it. What are you talking about? The two, the two women, I can't say girls. <laughs> I can't say young women. I don't know how old they were when they wrote the song, but when they wrote the song, the two sisters, they're from Louisville. I, don't, I can't remember their fucking name. Murdy and Gertie Height. I don't know. I can't remember their names. But uh, but the happy. But how old would they be now? Would they be what, 120, 130 years old? They probably earned enough residuals off of that. I will look who, that up. Who would own Happy Birthday? Uh, well, I don't know who owns it, but it would certainly have a publishing company. Uh, happy Birthday to You, also known as Happy Birthday, is a song traditionally sung to celebrate a person's birthday. <laughs> well, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> And why are you investigating this anyway? The first thing you think about when you think about the song Happy Birthday is who owns the rights? Should they still be getting residuals? What's all right? But the songwriters now. the songwriters were Patty Hill and Mildred J. Hill. Although there you go. It says in parentheses, disputed. What? <laughs> Who's disputing the Hill girls? <laughs> and it was 1893 that the song was published by Clayton F. Summy. Well, now who's disputing this? Because I thought it was settled that they wrote this this song. These these poor young well, women. See. Patty Hill was a kindergarten prince, a kindergarten principal, excuse me, in Louisville, Kentucky. I uh, see. Huh? Developing teaching methods at the Little Loom House. See, the little loons were were learning from the Hill sisters. We've always been on the forefront here in Louisville of educating the loons. Are you familiar with the Little Loom House? I, my mother used to threaten to send me to the little loony house. Uh, Her sister Mildred was a pianist and composer. Wait a minute, a penis? A pianist. Oh, pianist, on the piano. She tickled the ivory. She tickled the ivories and a composer. The sisters used Good Morning to All as a song that young children would find easy to sing. The combination of melody and lyrics and Happy Birthday to You first appeared in print in 1912. None of the early appearances of the Happy Birthday to You lyrics included credits or copyright notices. The Summy Company registered a copyright in 1935, What? crediting authors Preston Ware Orum and Mrs. R. R. Forum or foreman, excuse me. Wait, wait a minute, Horum and Forum. What is this? A goddamn <laughs> fucking Marx Brothers? <laughs> Horum and Forum. There is no sanity clause. In 1988, Warner Chapel Music purchased the company owning the copyright for $25 million, what? with the value of Happy Birthday estimated at $5 million. Warner claimed that the United States copyright would not expire until 2030 and that unauthorized public performances of the song were illegal what? unless royalties were paid. That's why you never hear it in movies. What movie have you ever heard the song sung in? Well, now you got me there. That's why it's never in movies. It's only in classrooms. <laughs> That's why it's Good never Lord. sung in movies. So there it is. Uh, some Louisville history on your birthday. Wait a minute. I have had Happy Birthday sung to me on television, on wrestling TV. By Sunny. Haven't I? By Sunny, right? No, I was going to say her as Marilyn Monroe, but she wasn't singing it to but you. No, 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 not to <laughs> me. But, but no, I would leave you. No, I'm talking about we've done fucking bullshit with the bodies or the midnight or whatever, and they've sung, and, and we sang Happy Birthday to Fifi the dog. That's right. I remember that for sure. And this show got canceled, right? Uh, immediately afterwards, yes. And Michael St. John was off key. I blame him. Hey, speaking of Louisville history, just because people have suddenly started sending me this in the last week, what do you know about the story about the horse getting caught in a tree? What? Have you ever seen this picture from 
Louisville, Kentucky have a horse in a tree? From when? Recently? No, it's an old picture from like oh, after, after a tornado. I guess the horse got blown all the way to the top of the tree and died, yeah. and they couldn't get it down. Well, these things happen in tornadoes. All right. Yeah. It's that expert commentary. You can only get here. <laughs> yeah, I, you're just trying to steal my fence post turtle story. It's <laughs> what you're doing here. All kinds of strange things can happen, Annie M, when the twister's coming. You, you, can, you can see goddamn uh, telephone poles through fucking walls, or you can see goddamn minor little items through telephone poles. And things appear where they shouldn't be. Or horses and, and trees. Horses and trees. It's rain and horses. Hallelujah. It's rain. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about, uh, we're not going to talk about the wrestling for a little while, but oh, you know what we are going to talk about? Happy birthday to me. Thank you to everyone who has uh, 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 jumped on jimcornette.com and gotten their Midnight Express 40th anniversary action figure set deluxe uh, super duper package. And I'll have you know that I've already signed uh, a several hundred of the personalized photos and the feather bottoms are predicting that they will be able to start sending out the pre-ordered sets earlier than the first or second week of October that we had predicted because of their incredibly streamlined the mcdonald brothers could have learned a lot and ray Kroc too from this speedy service system they got going on but it, it the, while that is underway i will remind everybody that there is now way less than half of what we started with and if you want to make uh sure that you get your only one and only action figure set of all four members of the Midnight Express, along with the color book of milestones in our careers, the autographed photo and the certificate of authenticity. You can order now with impunity at jimcornette.com. And for those of you who have, we suspended sales of all of our other merchandise, t-shirts, books, pictures, etc., because we wanted to get ahead of the brunt of this. And we now have 1200 sets to send out, but we're, we're getting there folks. But the regular merchandise will come back up with the start of our Christmas season sale on Saturday, October 7th at noon Eastern time. So that's what's going on there. And if there are indeed Midnight Express figures left at that point in time, then you can order them and something else. So we're, we're doing you a favor. We're letting you spend more money on October 7th. What are we hearing from speaking of spending money? Since it could have been a dark and dreary holiday season around Castle Cornet and Last Manor if it wasn't for the fact that we were smart enough to have other streams of income besides the weasel. A, a Colin Thompson has been exposed for the fraud, the charlatan, the carpetbagger that he is all over every kind of media. I think I've seen billboards. Does this man owe you money? He's been on the news. He's been on the websites. He's been in on podcasts, Whitney Cummings came out and said, well, it's a, just what she didn't even cuss. She just said, it's a, it's a darn shame that people like him exist or something. Oh, no. to that effect. Hold on. I have the quote here. Uh, the whole thing is a nightmare. That's the quote from Whitney Cummings. Well, there you go. And, uh, so what is the latest that we found out? You know, I looked up the word disparagement, Brian, you know, I got the American heritage dictionary here. The, the third edition. When was this published? This is the one I've been using for 1994. So as long as a word hadn't come out in the last 30 years, I'm pretty good here. And uh, when I go to disparagement, now I've lost the the goddamn page. There's dissemble. That's a good one to conceal the real nature or motives of. Or dispossess to deprive of possession, e.g. land or property. Uh, but when I go, what was I doing? Disparagement. To speak of in a slighting way or belittle. And we were accused of doing such a thing. And that was proven completely false and without merit, right from the guy's own chicken lips, because 
He can't even keep the chronological order of his lies straight. He accused us of doing something and making him do something that he did before we did. See, I said it perfect, just like that. And again, what makes it a deal was what he said was provably false. He said something that was ridiculous, something that was a chronological impossibility. He said it about Jim and myself, the Arcadian Vanguard production, about all of the shows that you guys listen to. He said that we did something causing him to do something called hiding your assets. That we did something to cause that, despite the fact he did it before we ever said a word publicly. But that's okay, because uh, our friend Coffeezilla there said, you know what, just to make sure, just to make sure, I went back and listened to the Cornet and Last shows, and it just wasn't there. It wasn't even Owen. It was fictitious. It was Colin. He was there. You know and what? <laughs> I'm just going to say, this this guy is such an idiot now, and he's like a deer caught in the headlights that everybody in the known, at least English-speaking world, is looking for him to ask him where all the millions and millions of dollars that he stole is. And again, he shouldn't be able to work anymore in podcasting, and he shouldn't be able to go out there and work with advertisers or creators. He's proven that he can't deal with that like a non-criminal human being. <laughs> a couple of things I want to uh, mention to you, Jim, from an article that came out in Bloomberg by Ashley Carmen, a fight over missing ad money royals the podcasting in or podcast, excuse me, royals the podcast industry. And let me scroll down here a little bit because some information we're finding out. Yesterday, as this was published, which was on September 14th, yesterday, Alex Weiss, a podcaster who goes by A-dubs, filed a lawsuit echoing the previous allegations. The case claims that in September 2021, Cass signed a two-year deal for her, excuse me, with her, for $550,000 overall, which would be paid in equal monthly installments. In June 2022, however, Cass allegedly stopped making payments. Lawyers for Cass did not respond to a request for comment about the lawsuit. Let's stop there before we go on any further. Timeline-wise, that's very interesting. Because if you remember what Colin said in the CoffeeZilla video, February 2022 to February 2023 is where everything changed, and it hit the wall in June. That's when he stopped paying her. It hit the, well, wall, yeah. it hit the wall, and right away he just stopped paying? Just like that? Well, you hold on here, and also let's back up and do some mathematics, because I've never heard of A-dubs. I'm sure she's a fine young lady. I've heard of B-dubs. They've got great wings, although I've, they're a little skimpier on the portions than they used to be, but nevertheless. But it, it, 550 grand, did you say, over two years, that would be 275 grand a year, right? Correct. $275,000 a year. Do it as twenty something thousand dollars a a month, right? Or about five grand, whatever the case. What did he get from that from her? Was she just saying, "Okay, you sell the ads and keep them"? Because I don't know what her audience is, but um, somebody's getting fucked there. What if if she's got a popular show, she's getting fucked. If if she doesn't. He's getting fucked, and why would you... I'm not sure why you'd do that. But again, if she doesn't, then we don't know anything about her business, so we're just making some yes. guesses here, hypotheses as we talk about this. If, let's say, her show couldn't justify that amount of money, which you would argue that's when you have a discussion with her or her management or whoever it may be, and you say, can we do something? We're having issues. It says in June they stop payment. Just stop sending any money. Yeah. Just like that. Which right away puts that person in breach of contract. We need to mention. But how would that affect everyone else? If you're not paying the person you have the minimum guarantee to, but the money is still coming in, you know, the Jim Cornette programs were still billing, we're still making revenue, 
that money was still coming in. Where was it, if it wasn't associated to someone like Alex Weiss, because that's what we're being told. He took the money that everyone was owed and he paid other shows that had minimum guarantees. Where was it going? Because this is June. Let me go back to this. In the suit, Weiss claims that around November 2022, Thompson's lawyer emailed to say Cast wanted to terminate her contract, in part because the content of her podcast was, quote, obscene <laughs> and, quote, vulgar. <laughs> and by the way, this is Colin, who in that video that he just did, that interview where he looked awful, I'm not even talking about physically. I'm just talking about the way he presented himself in that CoffeeZilla interview. Remember what he said about cast media? Where's the $4 million? I had a vision and a dream, and we were going to buck the trend and fight the system and let people speak free expression. They hit her with obscene and vulgar. This skateboarder. What was she saying on that show that was so Did obscene and vulgar? she be more vulgar than we are? And if so, how can we step up our game? According to the lawsuit, the lawyer made her an offer. If she agreed to terminate her original contract with Cast, she would then receive three months' worth of unpaid installments. The lawsuit claims that Weiss entered into the agreement, but then never received the money, and is still owed $68,750. So... In addition, so, well, hold on. Well, In addition to financial damages, the lawsuit is also seeking an audit of Cast's accounting. There which Weiss go. claims she's entitled to under her original contract. Boom. Boy, they better start working a copy machine overtime on Collins' accounting. But is the th so they say they trump up some bullshit. Well, we got to get out of this deal. So we'll give you part of what we owe you if you will get out of this contract. Okay, yeah, let me get out of this contract with you people for part. Of and then they don't pay her the part. You know, Vince went to Brett and said, I can't pay you. Negotiate with Bischoff again. Whatever was true or what it wasn't, Vince went to Brett and said, I can't pay you. I can't afford this contract. Go talk to Bischoff. He didn't say, Brett, come into my office. I have to fire you today for <laughs> vulgarity and obscenity. And, and Brett's like, what the fuck? I'm sorry. But, you know, if you take this offer here, you'll get some money. This is a, such a shady way to do business. Well, it's it's just it's uh, heartwarming to know that a lot of people are finding out because this story again has been covered in so many ev everywhere from Billboard to Bloomberg to Pod News, and you know, once again, I, I think I said this on your show a couple of days ago. When this thing started, it was our money, and obviously we were pissed, and we were gonna be talking about it anyway, but it didn't take too long to realize that there's this fucking thing was a lot bigger and involved a lot more people and was going to get a lot more attention, especially when this stock scheme got involved and is now exposed and what they're the podcast one new company stock and the live one parent company stock put together one share of each will not currently buy you a fucking hot and juicy Dave's single at Wendy's. It wouldn't get my cappuccino in the morning. So, and, and, and you can fucking probably survive a little bit longer by drinking the cappuccino or eating the fucking Wendy's Dave and Buster's fucking juicy goddamn single. You see what they're doing now? Every day they put out another press release to try to turn the tide a little bit. Like, we have a well, big stock buyback now. Yeah, you're buying the stock that no one else will buy. You're buying your own stock that no one else will buy. Good job. Ex explain that to me, Brian Buffett, because it, it, that's the thing. Now, how are they artificially trying to inflate the price of their stock with their own money by buying some of it back so it looks like more people want to buy it? How does this work? Help well, I, me. I'm not exactly saying they're doing that, and either are you, but I'm saying that. How would If someone was doing that, how would that be done? Well, again, you're seeing movement in the stock. You look for some sort of positive signs in the stock. If you're someone who's willing to avoid things like, you know, financials, and you're just looking for a stock that's going to make some moves, you're watching to see what's going to happen. If it looks like a bunch of people are jumping in and buying something, you may want to take the ride if you're that kind of investor or that kind of trader. Me, I go the other way. <laughs> and I look at other stocks that actually make some sense, may have a dividend, may have some chance of some fucking growth I'm going to make some money out of? 
not this. Again, not only would I not buy it, Jim and I said no to accepting it. We turned it down to even have it. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't want our fingerprints on it. That's right. And, you know, there's going to still be a lot more. And how do I put this so that it reveals a little bit, but not too much? You know, forensic accountants make a lot of money because they're able to go and really put shit together where there is a lot of questions. And there certainly are a lot of accountants that work for cast media that probably don't want to spend a ton of money on lawyers, which, based on what we're all learning, may be something they would have to do. And I think when the books have been played with, possibly going back much earlier than any of the signs that anyone noticed, we're not talking about getting accounting from Colin anymore. I mean, that, we can't trust Colin. And if Colin's the only one who had access to anything, it's going after his bank records. And then it's going after the actual orders from agencies and advertisers for everyone. Because Colin's books are fucked. We all know that by now. And no one could trust any of those accountants. The most recent one, Michael Calabretta, was the one who sent me two different sets of numbers <laughs> for what we were owed at different points. Well, he just said, pick the ones you like best. So I think that's going to be a big part of the story now. Everyone knows this happened. Everyone saw Colin in that CoffeeZilla video. You see what kind of weasel he is. We're calling him a weasel based on our personal dealings with him. He's a weasel. Steals other people's money and then tries to make himself the victim. And if he wanted to look like somebody, he needs to get out of that closet. He is sitting there, in, obviously, it, with his laptop on Zoom or Skype or whatever, sitting in his closet with his goddamn shelves behind him with his big fucking weird-looking head there. It looked like he was hiding from law enforcement on the video. Get out of the, your closet, Colin. Yeah, you see, that was, I think, part of a strategy. He didn't do it from a big, glorious room in his house. He didn't do it from his bedroom. He did it in the darkest area, wore a dirty shirt, looked disheveled, and then wanted to tell his story. Let me tell you my story. You know what the problem is with his story? There's hundreds of people that are also in that story, and not one of them would agree with his version of it. That's a problem. He's a bullshit artist, and he's been one for a while, and there's going to be more stories coming out about this. I'll tell you one other thing, and I don't know how much we want to get into it today, but we could talk about it in the future. There's a guy who was on the CoffeeZilla piece, Dustin Knaus, Colin's, I guess, former business partner. I don't think they're still working together, but that's how he was introduced on this show. And he was involved with production. And there's a story about how he got fired that is so despicable, so disgusting that it speaks volumes to the character of Colin Thompson. But I think we'll save that for the drive through But I saw this story, and I know a couple other people that know this story, and everyone had the same reaction. You know, we all have our enemies, especially us weirdo wrestling people. <laughs> we all have our enemies. Even those people, there's some things you're like, you know, I wouldn't do this to them. I would lay off of Russo if this had happened to him. So we'll talk about that on the drive through But there's more to come, and... Hey, the stock market's not open today. It's the weekend. It's Jim's birthday. We'll pay attention to this big stock. They keep putting out these statements. Let's see what the next big statement is. And we'll take it from there. But you know what? That's how they got, uh, that's how they got Capone was the accountants. That's how they get all the big white-collar criminals is, is the accounting then the accountants and the people who flip instead of serve, as in flipping sides instead of serving time. I can think of five different accountants. How much money do you think they want to spend on lawyers? And how much time do you think any of them would want to go to federal prison for helping out in whatever financial games Colin was playing affecting us podcasters all across the United States? Well, at least if they either have to serve time or et cetera, they, they'll be able to figure it out because they're good with numbers. Once again, if you're hearing this, this segment has been cleared by Stephen Pinu, the greatest attorney in the world, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com.
And, uh, you know, should we get this out of the way now? Just talk about the AEW just to get it over with. Just real briefly. What is there to talk about? Well, that's the thing, is I just wanted to remark on what they tried. It's my birthday. I believe I mentioned that in this program. And for my birthday week, I decided I was not going to watch horse shit that I didn't want to see. And uh, that was going to go for both companies. And then I'll be goddamned if the WWE did not only give us the new ownership, but John Cena and the fucking Rock in the same week. So I had to pay attention to some of that. The most electrifying segment of wrestling I've seen in, in some time was this week. Hint, hint. But, uh, you know, I had the AEW on the on the DVR, all the other initials, and I just, I, I kept walking by it and looking by like, I, I, I'm not going to punch that button. I just can't do that to myself. I can't do it to the listeners. But I'm going I'm to just briefly tell you what they expected us to watch this week. And also, we've got to talk about something that you just informed me of that everybody's talking about from last night here in a second. But this past week, and I've got to, <laughs> I've got to say in all honesty, I did watch when it happened a couple of chunks of the Wednesday night program because I noticed that it was eight o'clock and I said, let's see what they're starting with. I want to see if it was pockets and it was the plumber and big bill. And I thought, at least it's not pockets. And I had that on while I was feeding Harley and gathering some things up, going to the other room. And there was a, a spot. And of course, Starks is with Big Bill. There was a spot in that match where I said that I think they're going to put Big Bill over. And they should have. It, it, Starks had done something. Moxley had foiled that, and Big Bill got a big move on him. And I said, if they do that, it would be perfect. Then, of course, the fucking sunken-chested, buggy-whip-armed, bald-headed, pathetic-looking fucking plumber kicked out and then went on to tap out the seven-foot giant while he was bleeding like a stuck fucking hog and acting unprofessionally. But it would have got Big Bill over. It wouldn't have hurt the plumber because... If you've seen John Moxley wrestle twice and you still want to see him ever wrestle again, it ain't his wrestling that you're into. It's whatever you see in your head, you buy into the same thing he buys into, the, that people could buy him as a fucking badass. But if, if Big Bill had won, it would have helped him. But he didn't. He got tapped out by the guy fucking bleeding all over him and flipping the bird and et cetera, et cetera. And I guess Jericho and Sammy talk to each other and they're going to wrestle at some point. And Adam Page beat Brian Cage. And Darby Allen and Nick Wayne beat Mac Daddy and Cool Hand Luke. Well, you really are firing through this review. Yes, because that's the thing. This is what they expected you to watch. And then I came back because the one thing I did want to see and I didn't make notes on it, I just enjoyed watching it. Was Samoa Joe and Roderick Strong in the tournament final, the tournament that they're going to fucking have a title shot some goddamn where until the next tournament? I don't I can't even keep track of Tony's goddamn... It looks like fucking Charlie on Always Sunny has the fucking yarn strung out on the map on the wall trying to figure this out. But it's Samoa Joe and Roderick Strong, and they're fucking excellent. And they're two pros, and they had a great match, and Joe beat Roddy, and then when Adam Cole tried to come down and check on him playing a little bit of possum about his neck, then Joe choked out Adam Cole, and he's the best heel in AEW right now. And unfortunately, it's not even close, I don't think, so... But that... Uh... Wow. Yeah. Well, that was AEW Dynamite for the 13th of September. Yeah. The first three-minute Dynamite review. Jim, how do you feel about that? I have. I wish it could have been two and a half, but I had to recognize quality where I saw it. 
Did you? How much of the Joe uh, Roddy stuff did you watch in the post match? Um, well, and, and that's, you know, he choked out Cole and stood over him and he screaming at MJF, I'm going to take everything away from you and got to his face and he's slobbering. It's good to go back to a goddamn scary looking, aggressive, remorseless fucking heel in wrestling after all of these goddamn sissy ass whiny ass smart aleck whatever the fuck bullshit that we have to put up with from these scripted heels over on the other program and the fucking guys in AEW mostly in real life couldn't fucking scare a moth off a goddamn lampshade see that's the pro that's my biggest problem with everything with roddy strong let me just say samoa joe did a great promo when he said i'm gonna take everything i'm like what does that mean is he gonna beat up his mom like what the fuck is <laughs> he gonna do but the problem is Roddy's really good in the ring and he needs some kind of personality, but wrestling, like if you look at like the eighties and I hate to bring everything back there, everybody's like, Oh, you're an old man. But you know, Barry Windham, I uh, thinking of guys who broke in, you know, Terry Gordy, even though he started yeah. in the seventies, all these guys, they were really young acting older before mentally they were adults. They behaved like adults, at least on TV. I mean, maybe crazy adults, Yes. But now it's like adults acting like children, not even just children, like teenagers from the late nineties into the new century. Like it's outdated even in that, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like children now. I don't know how connected the young bucks, Adam Cole and Roddy strong are to the youth of America, <laughs> but that's the problem. You know, the match was Roddy good. looks like a nerd is what you're saying with the glasses and doing the promos with Taven and Bennett who have made questionable hair decisions. I remember when Matt Taven looked like a goddamn Greek God with the long hair. And now I don't know what the fuck he's got on his head. He looks like an artichoke, but the ridiculousness of Adam Cole looking at the ring, Roddy seeing him and then Roddy all of a sudden falling down. Like he is hurt worse than he is. Yes. And Cole somehow missed all that. And then Taven and Bennett, it's like they're children. They're yelling at him like children. And yeah. it just makes the whole thing unbelievable. But Samoa Joe is really good. The problem is show wide. There's nothing. You know, next week is AEW Arthur Ashe Stadium, right? I'll, 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 I'll hang with you there. I'll I think follow. it is. I think it's coming up this next week. Samoa Joe, MJF, some other stuff. Two years ago, AEW, we talked about it on the air, it felt so hot. Punk came in. Whatever drama happened, Punk gave us a year of highlights on that show. We knew no matter how bad it was, his segment was typically going to be really good. Danielson came in, and that has been a disappointing run because they really never got like an extended multi-month great run out of Danielson. There's been a lot of starts and stops. And he doesn't mean today what he meant a few years ago, I don't think. If, he, if he's in the group for any other reason than, than to hide physical shortcomings in wrestling and having a focus put on him as a single, which we could all understand is health. If, if there's any other reason than that, they've just buried him in a fucking group of goofs. But they're running out of talent they can get. You know, CM Punk and Danielson were the two biggest free agents that had been out there in a long time. It wasn't like they were just another couple of free agents. They were big. There aren't those guys anymore. It's the same people on the shows that were on the shows two years ago. There's not a lot of change. MJF as a babyface is one of the few fresh things they have in that company. Everything else is stale. It's becoming like, you know, Gunkle in 74, it's the same roster. Just, <laughs> no, because they ran out of talent. There well, was no, nowhere I, else to I, get talent. I laughed because it, it's, it's it, exactly the same people as two years ago we're seeing every fucking week because we can't get any more. They've cut off our talent. And only in this case, nobody's cut it off. There is none. They spent a couple of years building up Jay Cargill. She loses one match, then apparently makes a deal with WWE or <laughs> thinks she's about to, comes back, loses a match on Rampage. So you don't even get anything out of her losing the match. You put her on the show that no one watches. You spent a, two years building her up on TV. She lost a match on pay-per-view, barely got mentioned after that, then shows up again, and you have her lose on the way out to one of your champions in a position that it should make her look good on the show that no one watches. On the least watched program. 
they're going to have a lot of problems. You know, MJF, whenever that contract really comes up, that's exactly the kind of guy WWE and specifically Endeavor want working for WWE. And AEW has not been able to calm the chaos, the behind the scenes drama, the childishness beyond the bucks and all that. Like, just the childishness in the office. And I think they can survive as long as they want because of Tony and because they'll be able to get some numbers and they'll be able to get a rights fee, but the shows are becoming tougher and tougher to watch, even for some of us who, when things were bad, found things to laugh at and enjoy. It's becoming tougher and tougher to watch. Well, and, and here's the thing, again, as you mentioned, who's out there and who the WWE might be looking for in the future. And th there's the AEW fans, I'm sure, think you can bring El Hijo del Vikingo uh, it, or some other indie darling or, you know, somebody from some small organization that we've never heard of before that can do flips, and that'll be brand new stars. See Action Andretti. But the fact is, there's not on a major worldwide stage now or ready for one, you know, the answer to anybody's problems that's going to be available anytime soon contractually that, that we can, and that's why the people that say, oh, well, we don't know if the WWE will take CM Punk back. If CM Punk wants to go back to wrestling, they will take him. Because who else in the world right now or for the next year contractually would make a bigger difference in WWE's business than CM Punk. And how hot was Cody in AEW when he goes there and it's a whole new world? Punk was the same thing. It, it only probably more magnified because he's more controversial. He's gotten more attention in the period of time leading up to his potential debut there, whenever that may take place. In that People are interested because they now they don't know what to think about him. He's uh, the, is he a loose cannon? Is he fucking nuts? What the fuck's going to happen? And for the people who don't live their life on the internet, he's been away from wrestling for nine years now, not seven. And they're, they're going to fucking blow a gasket to see him back. You know, I said it as a joke a few months back, but it's true. I think I said SummerSlam. We can now change that. The biggest match in AEW history is CM Punk versus Cody Rhodes. And uh, I guess I guess technically Cody can't go for the real world championship, right? Because he <laughs> early on at AEW said he never would. But that's the biggest thing. And if Cody gets off course with Roman because of The Rock, and we'll see what happens. Ooh. Punk and Cody, if they gave it time and they let it, let these guys promo each other. Oh my God, it would be incredible. And that's the problem. Punk is still the guy from AEW everyone's talking about, and he's not even there anymore. And more than likely, he's not going back. AEW has nothing really happening right now. And they're killing their live crowds for everyone who was like, oh, Wembley, Wembley, Wembley. What about Cincinnati? <laughs> like, they can't get anyone to go to their live shows. I remember Cincinnati. It was one of our great towns. See, you and me will disagree on one thing, because it's kind of a weird paper. I think you will. But like Zack Sabre Jr. versus Danielson, I'm all for putting that on the pay-per-view. There are fans who, if that match happened, they would immediately want to go out of their way and find that match. Is it 100,000 fans? I don't know. But they'll pay to see that match. Put it on pay-per-view. Fine. But the week-to-week -week TVs to build up to any of this stuff is bad. And you can't just have pay-per-views of dream matches. Because eventually, you're going to run out of those. And well, AEW's pay-per-views are still built around like dream matches. And WWE's pay-per-views are built around personalities and events. And that, that's what I said the other day, is that, you know, Tony's a matchmaker, he's not a booker, because a matchmaker writes down this guy versus this guy, but a booker gives them reason to have a conflict and, and a backstory that people can follow along and who's going to get even with who or gain what or whatever. That's the booking. But again, with... <sighs> I wouldn't mind Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. being on pay-per-view either in concept, except that when they're, they've just spit out two pay-per-views, 
uh, within a week of each other. They're talking about one for four weeks after the last one. They've just fired their biggest pay-per-view draw, not just anecdotally, but historically by the metrics, by the measurements, Punk has main evented their biggest pay-per-views. They've just fired him. And Danielson is, again, one of the upper echelon of the talent they've got there right now. And instead of being in something possibly important to draw the fucking pay-per-view buys from the general population of AEW fans, he's going for the really most devoted that want to see that dream match for absolutely no reason from a guy that we've seen on TV twice. Rather than Brian Danielson and fucking MJF and a goddamn dance-off, I don't know. Intermix your top talent with your main fucking roster when you're trying to draw this many pay-per-view buys in this goddamn short a period of time and the people might be interested in the personalities if they see him on TV every fucking week. Does that make any sense? It makes sense. That's why AEW doesn't do it. Well, here's something else they didn't do on Collision. I'll tell you that. I didn't see a goddamn second of this except what you endorsed to me. Uh, but there was one. <laughs> I wouldn't say endorse. <laughs> well, you, you've let me know about it. There was one thing I would have liked to have seen. Starks and Big Bill beat Claudio and Danielson. Just because that probably would have been pretty fucking good. But it's my birthday. Otherwise, FTR beat the Iron Savages, formerly the Bear, Bear Boulders or the goddamn, I don't know, the Bunny Men. The, what, what were they before? Bear Bronson and Bear Boulder? The Bear, Bear Backs. Country, Bear Backs. Long John Silver apparently barebacked Anthony Bowens. Excuse me. <laughs> that was the next yeah, match. You may want to put that a different way. <laughs> Long John Silver then apparently just pounded Anthony Bowens. <laughs> and, then, and then Ozzy Oldham beat some job guys. This was the Saturday night program that we looked forward to for about, what, two and a half months? And then that's the problem. I don't want to, like you said, I'm not even a big Claudio fan, but I would have wanted to see that tag match. It's not worth it for me to like get, unless we have to watch it for the show. I don't want to watch it to get to the one match. (sighs) Andrade beat Scorpio Sky. The Righteous, who are two guys named Vincent and Dutch. I haven't, I think we saw a brief clip. I don't know what they fucking look like. I've seen them, their names written down. We shall see at some time in the future, but they beat the Hardy boys. So apparently they're trying to push these fucking fellas. And Chris Stadlander beat Britt Baker. And that was Saturday night's collision. And we don't know what the ratings were yet, but did we ever check... We know that they went in the toilet the night that Tony made the announcement on September 2nd. It started at 400 and something thousand up against, uh, what was it, some payback, payback, and ended at 200 and something thousand. People were disgusted. What was last week? Did last week register? Uh, Ash marks? What did they get? Yeah, give me a second. I think it recovered a bit. Last week, me- uh, last week, last, last week. week, last week, last week, those mooks. Last week, they did 476,000 moors. But where'd they start and where'd they finish? Okay, they started segment one. I do, you, don't, you don't have to give me the whole thing. Give me segment one and segment eight, if it's, if it's that's the extremes of the thing. There's a few extremes here. Let me just give you a couple uh, Oh, a few extremes. Well, segment one, Mox, uh, this is from WrestleNomics, compiled by WrestleNomics. Moxley versus Action Andretti opened at 424. Segment two, which is a continuation of that match, and then uh, something with Jade Cargill, 521. That's the high point. Jesus (laughs) Christ. That's the high point. 456, 444, uh, 499, 483, 493, 489. So pretty consistent across the board. But unfortunately, um, they were not against a WWE pay-per-view, and... Still did kind of the fucking thing. A few more weeks of that show becoming AEW's Saturday night 
rampage and we'll see what happens because that's the way it felt to me. It didn't feel, you know, dynamite has so many problems and you just talked about them in your three minute review, but that's the show you're going to check out. Rampage ran us off quick. And obviously we were just an example of the rest of the audience. Collision's doing the same. It's happening right now. So we'll see where that number goes in a month or two months because how many more shows could open up with Orange Cassidy or Moxley? <clears throat> Even if you're a fan of theirs, right? I mean, at what point do you get something different or something new? It never happens. But you saw the Keith Lee thing, right? Well, and that's, that's what I was going to mention because you pointed that out to me on Twitter and everybody, what is the... That made the air, and what I'm going to describe what made the air for the people, many people who didn't watch that program last night. But they're in the back with Lexi, the interviewer, correct? And, correct. Uh, she is interviewing Keith Lee, and it's one in front of the set that says AEW Collision, one of the backstage interviews. And in the background, you can hear from the arena FTR's music. Apparently, they were either going to or coming from the ring or whatever. I don't know the context of the program, but they would be transitioning. Probably they've come from them in the ring, and now they're backstage, right? Something like that. Something. So at any rate, the, the thing that everybody's talking about is you see a wide shot of the interview set and the Lexi and Keith Lee about to be interviewed and you see the arms of the uh, one of the uh, floor directors or producer or whatever's you know the production assistant whoever's and they didn't even have a clapper they just did a clap with the hands but the clapper it the old silent movie bullshit where they've got the clapper you really do that in television but it's a small clapper that they just, boom, they do it in front of the, the camera so that you can sync up with this computerized editing now, the audio and the video. If you have the clapper, you see at the exact moment the clap closes and the clap makes the sound, you can sync those up because now you can move audio and video wherever the fuck you want it. Does everybody understand what the fuck the purpose of that is now? Yeah, I think everyone knows what that is. All right, well, no, people that don't do television. Then they don't know what the fuck's going on. But anyway, this guy, they don't have a clapper. They got the guy to clap his hands. But he does, okay. And you hear, take 22, collision, and he does the clap. And then the camera moves in kind of herky-jerky to get it shot. And then the, you hear the guy off camera count down, Five, four, three, and you hear silence because a lot of people, there's never a one, and a lot of people don't do two because that leaves you room to edit, of the, you know, the piece of business you've just done. And you don't, you can't get in between one, go, whatever. And so you leave a couple seconds of silence. And now, Brian, now that I've described it, Tell me what, are they defending it? Is somebody saying it was done as an inside joke or everybody's talking about it because it looked like an obvious production fuck up, but is there some now th reason to believe that they did that on purpose, you were saying? Well, someone said something that they may have done it before, used the term take 22, um, you know, which could be Tony's uh, code for, you know, like the guy with the stuff is backstage. <laughs> no, <laughs> they, um, they apparently have done it before. I have to check into that. But the fact that it got on the air and it was a little awkward and all it did was make people talk about how unprofessional it was. Like, it doesn't make people go, you got to see this show. They just go backstage when they're not even ready. Like, <laughs> no one's going to give a shit about that. <laughs> the only thing that makes people do is talk about what is wrong with the production team. No, I saw the clip. And without seeing where they were, it was just the start of that clip and, you know, the, the, the botch, and then he starts in the interview. That's the only part I saw. I actually still have the program on my DVR, so I'll probably end up out of morbid curiosity trying to find that piece. But since I saw that portion of it, I will share what I think and what I told you I thought was going on. Here's the thing. If... 
if they were doing pre-tape interviews backstage where they were going to insert them later on in the program and they weren't live, then you wouldn't be able to hear the sounds of the arena, music that was playing or whatever, because it if they're doing it before it's going to air, the sound wouldn't match, right? So they do do, I said do do, they do do pre-taped interviews back there, but when they play them, they will pipe the live crowd or the live music that's playing in the arena. They'll bring that audio in over it so it looks like it matches. Have I said that to where people would get it, Brian? Yes. Okay. And at the same time, it looked very legitimate to me, having seen bloody thousands of these things, like the production assistant doing the clap and the fucking uh, cameraman getting his shot and the talent being counted down and doing it. Having said that, and also saying there's absolutely no reason, as you mentioned, or it would have been done in a more entertaining way, uh, there's no reason to make your production look goofy like that. So what I think is I think it was a pre-tape that was done earlier in the day or in the evening. The noise or the music from the arena, what was going on with FTR, was being piped in over the top of a pre-tape that was being played in the truck so that it would go out together over the air so that it would appear to be live. And some idiot wrote down the time code number about eight seconds wrong, and they cued the video up to the time code number that was written down on their B-roll machine so that when the announcers out of the arena pitched to, let's go backstage with Lexi and poor old Keith Lee, the video that they hit the button for and fucking the director took was cued up like eight seconds too early. That's what I think happened. I'm I'm proud to be proven wrong if anybody was there and can give me a better explanation. It was an inside joke. I <laughs> decided to play. Me and Lexi. We're comedians. But you know, you can't depend on anything anymore, Brian. You cannot depend on anything anymore. It's uncertain times we live in. Yes, they are. I'm telling you, the world is an uncertain play. You never know when you're going to get pitched to things that are wrong or geared up wrong or queued up wrong. You never know about the the up and down stock market, as we've been talking about with, if you're affiliated with certain individuals, it's mostly down instead of up. But, well, you've seen the stock market. It's been bumping its head on the ceiling for what now? Back and forth for two years. It just goes up and down, up and down, right in the same place, like it's stuck. And and there's the debt ceiling. Well, we're hitting that too. Every we get more and more debt until we hit the ceiling. And then we got knots on our head. Government instability. Many governments around the world are unstable, Brian. Including some of the people in our own government are mentally unstable. So we got that going for us. You, you, what do you do with your money where you, where you, where you want to feel safe? You want to feel like no matter what happens, you're covered, you've got something in your hands or in your possession that will be good for something. When the apocalypse comes, when there are nuclear fire showers raining down on us, when the apes gain the ability to speak, you think a, a piece of paper like a dollar bill, Brian's going to be any good? You think of a rag, a rag of paper like a stock certificate is going to be any good? Not after an apocalypse, not when the aliens land, not if Trump gets elected again. No, but you know what's always going to be good as gold, Brian? What's that? Gold. Gold has been good as gold since gold was invented because that's the thing that everybody, it's shiny and you can rub up against it and love on it and it glitters. Gold finger. I'm, that's why he was so wrapped up in it. Not only because he had many hot women that were painted gold, but gold and silver. The silver surfer, the man in the silver mask. You know, all the uh, gold and silver have attracted 
the human race, mankind, the homo sapien, since, since day one that they were invented and, and, and discovered. And now you can have gold and silver, Brian, through our friends at Nationwide Coins. Oh, man, I've always wanted gold and silver, Brian. No, I'm, I'm, I mean you, Brian, the royal you is who I'm referring to there. Oh. Don't make me refer to you in any other way here on this thing. Now, Nationwide Coins, I, I, you might not know who they are. Well, that's because they don't make the news a lot because they stay out of trouble. They're not right there on the tip of everybody's tongue when we're talking about crooks and charlatans and shysters. They're a, a reputable business, one of the nation's leading precious metal firms, and they don't get a lot of publicity because they don't commit crimes. What they do is they have 100 years of combined experience in the precious metals industry. And they know their gold and silver. They know where to mine it. They know how to smelt it. And they know how to dealt it, folks. And if you <laughs> smelt it, you dealt it. <laughs> I'm telling you, they got thousands of satisfied customers because think about this. Let's say bands of rabid wolverines are roaming the cities and there's no electricity and no internet service and no phone service. And there's no television. There's no radio. All there is is people with bags of gold and silver slung over their shoulders going from place to place trying to barter for things that they need. Well, you'll have the biggest bag of gold and silver because that way you know you've got something that's going to be valuable no matter what happens in this tenuous grasp on reality that we call a human race. Plus, you and, use it as a weapon, the bag of gold and silver. And, and, that's, and it's heavy shit too, boy. I'll tell you what. These, the coin they sent me, why, my God, I threw my shoulder out, trying my rotator cuff as I'm going to cash the coin in on a fucking orthopedic surgeon to fix my shoulder. But nevertheless, nationwide coins, they've got thousands of satisfied customers. They've got an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating, and they've got a 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. I don't know what they have to do with the airlines, but if the pilots trust them, then you know that you should too because they are the exclusive supplier of Don Everhart's signature coins. Now, I know you're going to say Don Everhart and his brother Phil, they had all those hits back in the golden era. Here she comes, it's Kathy's clown. But Don and Phil Everhart were more than just a pop singing duo. Don Everhart, later on, became the U.S. Mint's lead sculptor from 2004 to 2017. They tell me that Don Everhart is the most respected name in modern coins today. And apparently, he has signature coins now. I guess when he was with the U.S. Mint, he was taking their coins, and they put a stop to that, and now he's got his own coin. Don't say that. We don't want to accuse anyone of taking any coins from the U.S. Mint, certainly not the well, person who ran the U.S. Mint out of nowhere every, for no reason. Everybody that has coins got them from the U.S. Mint. Well, that's true. I guess that's well, true. Well, there you go. Well, but right some, now, uh, he's getting them from Nationwide Coins. And they're proudly partnered with Operation Finally Home, a charitable organization that designs and constructs custom homes for veterans in need. And then they take and they, they get into the fucking foundations and dig down in the basements of these homes. That's where they stash all their gold coins. What? That's no, how, they, that's how they're, they're keeping the government from finding out about this. No, the government, no, they're not keeping anything from the government. They're not hiding gold coins in the foundation of homes. Well, they're selling government gold at cost. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Well, do you think the government would want to know about this? For heaven's sake, if the government knew what they were doing, selling government gold at cost, they'd say, no, you've got to jack up the prices. You're going to cost us profit. That's how Nationwide Coins they're, they're selling you government gold at cost. As a matter of fact, all the new customers Get their first ounce of gold without any dealer markup whatsoever. When's the last time you bought an ounce of something and the dealer didn't mark it up? Anecdotally? Um, there you go. Nationwide coins selling government gold at cost, and that's why they bury all the gold coins down in the basements of these veterans. And where's the government not going to look? In the basement of a home of a veteran. And that's how they can pass the savings on to you, none ladies of this, and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, none of this happens, but it's fun to think about, and it's even more fun to think about holding a bag of your own silver and gold and coins <laughs> and Dale Everhart and, of course, 
the Everly Brothers, and Bye Bye Love, and it's almost That's bye bye for this spot. Jim, what else is going on with this, uh, with these coins? That's Don Everhart, not Dale Everhart. You're thinking of a race car driver, and if you want to be left holding the bag, folks, Nationwide Coins is the people you need to deal with, because if you've been thinking about exploring gold, we'll head to nationwidecoins.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE at checkout for your first one ounce gold coin without any dealer markup. Nationwidecoins.com slash JCE, the promo code JCE. You're going to get an ounce gold coin, a one ounce gold coin with no markups whatsoever. And it'll, it'll be non-sequential serial numbers. Now, you may wonder why that the president of Bolivia's face is on the front of the coin. No. That's just, that's just because of the, where it was mined. The gold came straight from the ocean off the coast of Bolivia. None of this is true, ladies and gentlemen. We are not off the coast of Bolivia. We are here in the United States, and we're talking about nationwide coins. Well, and they're selling government gold at cost. We didn't tell you what government it was. It's nationwide coins, not intercontinental coins. Well, does it have to be a particular nation? Can't they be all over the nations? Can't they be one of many? Can't we all just be together? Imagine. Oh, imagine oh, all of us on. living life as one. At nationwidecoins.com slash JCE, use the promo code JCE, get the gold coin, put it under your mattress. That, that'd probably be... The, the best thing, you could put your body in between the gold coin and the potential burglars that are going to break in and try to steal your stash of gold. Until the apocalypse. Until then, nationwide coins. Now, Brian, you know what else is good as gold? No. This program, because we've talked about a little wrestling of current days, and now we're going to, we're going to, I told you this is going to go my way. Are we are we far enough into the program where I can I can curse and and vent and rant if I don't get my way? Well, this or is your show. Be, this is your well, show. Well, I don't want to be rude, but uh, I thought what we would do for those of you who have been longing as we have been for a little classic wrestling discussion before we talk about the big week the WWE had with The Rock and Cena and McAfee and goddamn Taylor Swift is on the pro. I don't know what kind of stars they're pulling out here. We would go back and look at back when I was just a poor, underprivileged wrestling manager and or aspiring promoter back in the old days when I had to work on my birthday and, and see what some of them looked like. How about that? So what year are we starting from? 82? We're start well, no, I didn't work on my birthday in 1982 because I was just doing TV at that point. I hadn't started doing any shows or whatever. I wouldn't do my first house show in, what was that, end of September at the Cook Convention Center. Was it September 26, possibly? Did you take photos on your birthday ever at a wrestling show? Oh, God, yes. So you went to wrestling on your birthday is my Oh, point. God, yes. And even before, I did, my first birthday wrestling show was in 74. Lawler against Rufus R. Jones for the Southern Heavyweight title in a 19-man oh uh, pole battle royal and all kinds of good stuff. But anyway, no, 1983 is my first year. But now, And, and we're not going to go through all of them. I've had a bunch of birthdays, fortunately. I baffle science. Uh, I've had a bunch of birthdays since then. We're not going to do all of them because in the modern era... You know, if if your birthday falls on Tuesday, Wednesday, nobody runs that. Or I've been running my own business and they will take my birthday off, except when you are, you were around. And it, um, as a matter of fact, did you come to the New York show? My 50th birthday was at the Manhattan Center at a Ring of Honor event. Were you there that night? 2011. I don't think I was there for that. No, by that point, I was pretty pissed off with a few people involved with Ring of Honor. <laughs> So, in order to not embarrass you, I stayed away. Yeah. Well, I've, 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 we may have seen you on that trip. I don't know. But uh, but that's the last major time I think I worked on my birthday. I can't remember. But nevertheless, we th I thought we would go through some of these select 
years, I got my books out and see what I was doing and how I variously... Have, I've been fucked around a lot on my birthday in a wrestling business as I come to reflect on these books now. September 17th, 1983... To take, like you said earlier in the program, now does it count the whole 24 hour period when the clock turns midnight? So I'll start at midnight. I had been in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in front of a $3,750 house and make $70 to manage the grapplers against the Rock and Roll Express, the assassins against the fabulous ones, and wrestle in a battle royal. Where is that? Comparison Hopkins to Louisville. Hopkinsville is out in the western part of the uh, state, out near Eddyville and Paducah and that, uh, you know, more central western. And it's actually uh, not far from the Tennessee state line. My Uncle Dink, Dink Embry, used to be the morning man on WHOP Radio AM back in the, in the good old days in Hopkinsville. Uh, but then... It would, I can't remember whether it was a school or the armory or whatever, but we would get out of there about 10, 10, 15 at night and had to go to Memphis for TV. So that was 245 miles and we're starting at 10 o'clock and you would get in like two or three o'clock in the morning. And that's why by this point in time, I was living in Nashville with the, my first six months in the business. I was in Louisville. So I was making all the trips by myself because nobody else lived in Louisville and was starting and ending up in the same place. But even when I moved to Nashville, when I came back from Georgia that summer, like I've said, I'd ride with Bobby Eaton or, you know, he'd ride with me a lot of different places. And, you know, but then toward the fall, not only did I start getting booked on the buttermilk runs where they were running two towns a night. So a lot of guys would be maybe on one shitty town and then the good town the next night, but I'd be on all the shitty ones. But I always went to Memphis on Friday nights by myself for TV because the guys, they wanted to dick around or they wanted to eat somewhere. Or they wanted to drink or, you know, go, stay at the hotel where all the girls were going to be. But fuck it. At that point in my career, if I was going to get six hours of sleep or less and do live television, I went straight into Memphis, hopped off at the Red Roof Inn on Sycamore View Road, got a room for like 21 fucking dollars. As a matter of fact, it should be out, $21. It's, it's marked down here. And then I would get up the next morning and make sure I was at TV early so I knew what the fuck was going on and I could try to figure out what I was doing. So I did that two-hour boom, get in at 3 o'clock, whatever, be at TV 10 o'clock the next morning. And then that night, my birthday night, we were in Corinth, Mississippi, which is not far from Memphis, only 90 miles. And so, you know, you had time to dick around and eat at the New Orleans famous fried chicken place or whatever after TV. And then Corinth, unlike Tupelo, which had been run every Friday night since the dawn of time in one of the shittiest buildings I've ever worked in and was tired and beat up and wore out and didn't draw and nobody cared. Corinth beyond that a, beyond that <laughs> Corinth had a nice big fucking gym. I think at a school there and it did $9,500. And this was when a figure of $5 average ticket, that was 2000 people. So that was just swell. And that night, I only had one, two, three. I only had to work four times. I managed Dennis Condry, who beat Ken Wayne, who was working as the Stray Cat. Uh, I managed uh, Frank Morrell and, I believe, Duke Myers as Lucifer and the Prince of Darkness when they got beat by Terry Taylor and Bobby Eaton. Me and Jimmy Hart lost a handicap match to Coco Ware, and I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. But I made a hundred by God dollars. Was Coco stiff? Um, no, Coco wasn't stiff. And and plus, you know, it 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 was it wasn't like he was gonna fuck with us on purpose because we had to do shit. And also, we were the managers. We were hitting him from behind more than he was hitting us in the front. So no, I he wasn't drop kicking me or Jimmy like he you would see the 
videos of him hitting the job guys or whoever with the drop kick off the top rope. It was, it was a spot show match. And then I got in the car and it was only 170 miles back to Nashville. So I was back home by one in the morning. So I'd left Nashville at probably four o'clock on Friday afternoon, worked a show in Hopkinsville, worked three times, drove 240 miles to Memphis, did a TV that morning, drove 90 miles to Corinth, worked in four more matches, and then drove 170 miles back to Nashville and got back at one o'clock Sunday morning. That was my birthday. For $170 total. Your thoughts? <laughs> do you say anything to anyone, or do you know, sell that it's your birthday? Uh, well, I, no. I mean, it, it's not like I went and expecting cake or whatever, but if anybody said, how you doing? I said, hey, it's my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday. Now you're going to fucking do a job for goddamn Coco. I didn't know if that was the kind of thing that guys would just right away start ribbing you on if you started announcing it was your birthday to everyone. Well, no, I, you would you love your in. birthday. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I, now I do because I've had so many of them and I didn't expect to have this many. Back then it was, I still hadn't done it that much and it wasn't that big a deal. If somebody asked me how I was that day, I'd say, well, I'm good. It's my birthday, but I wouldn't go in going, it's my birthday. See, if it was nowadays, all the fans on the internet would know it was your birthday and then they'd start chanting that to you at the show. And then you'd have to do something where you break a fam and thank them for coming. <laughs> No, I would have just asked them all for cake. Well, you do that anyway. But anyway, that was 1983, by the way. And uh, we'll revisit the rest of that year at some point in the future. You, your favorite year is 1984. Would you like to hear 1984? 84 Mid-South, the best. In 1984, on September 17th, I was in New Orleans, Louisiana at the Downtown Municipal Auditorium. What day of the week do you know? That's a Monday night. Yes, I'm looking at the book right here. It was a Monday night because New Orleans was still at that point running. It used to be a weekly town on Monday night every week. And then in 84 and with dog leaving, it got to be intermittent and then started going to the lakefront arena for some of the shows, blah, blah, blah. But this was the old downtown building. And... We were living in Alexandria, Louisiana at that point, so it was 200 miles exactly from Alexandria to New Orleans. And the first, I'm going to say 120 miles of that was two-lane road. So it was a, from Alexandria, I mean, driving like bats out of hell 40 years ago when there was less traffic, it was still every bit of three and a half hours to get down there, right? <clears throat> so you left because you had to be there an hour beforehand and bell time was 7.30, so you left at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and if you were the main event, by the time you got out of downtown, they had to clear the people out of the you know area first so you could get to your car. You weren't back home till 2 o'clock if you were the main event, easily. When you're doing that many miles regularly for a year, a little over a year, actually, are there any local shows, or not even local, just any programs you hear on the radio that you start to like just because of the regularity of hearing different personalities and different things? Well, no, because we were never in the car in the morning when all the, per we, we were always, you know, in the afternoon, listening afternoon, evening, and the middle of the night. And we just, and we're going past and through so many different radio station markets we just hit the fucking button till we found some fucking classic rock well it, it wasn't classic rock then it was just rock and that you know it was a blur it was a fucking blur and the stay you would you would leave the station and it would start staticking and you'd fucking just turn the thing until you found something else that you liked so when you think about 84 mid-south being in the car what songs come to you right away like if you hear this song no. you're gonna think about being in that car there is there is one, the Eagles, because Dennis Condor used to make a joke out of this. This was 1984, right? When was the, the Eagles, the long run album released? 79, maybe? 78? 80. Was it 80? Okay. Point being. You like them a little better than I do. Well, point being, the Eagles, <laughs> Dennis would say we're the hottest fucking band on the goddamn radio in Louisiana. We suddenly went back in time four years. And they played the Eagles constantly on every radio station in that territory. And that was the fucking rib. You couldn't get away from them. But that, you know, that was, 
in those days, it was a joke. I don't even think it was confined to the wrestling business. You're now entering Louisiana, set your watches back 20 years, especially in the rural parts, Alexandria and Lake Charles, Lafayette. You know, Baton Rouge and New Orleans was a little, you know, more up-tempo, but oh boy. But that's what I'm asking too, because like the Rock and Roll Express exploded Mid-South in 84. And MTV, from what you know, how available was it in any of those markets? And, you know, that's the thing. Like, the Rock and Roll Express videos are like the Van Halen jump and various things. Was that music on the... Like, do you think of that? Like, yeah. Do you, do you hear oh, that yes. in the car? Oh, yes, it yeah. was all over the... Van Halen was all over jump, was all over... Whatever the rock and roll was coming out to was what was all over the radio. But also, Louisiana had cable in all those markets. They were shitty little local cable systems. But it, the thing was, as you might recall, some of the smaller markets in the country got cable first because it wasn't like New York. It wasn't this giant multi-billion dollar thing they were bidding on. It was like, yeah, let's go put fucking cable in goddamn Bogalusa. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. So MTV was huge in 1984 and the radio and Van Halen and they were they were seeing the goddamn same things everybody else was seeing. It was just it was a little bit more primitive fucking. There were no north and south interstates. You had I-10 from east to west at the bottom of the state and I-20 from Shreveport across through to Jackson, Mississippi at the top of the state and everything else was two-lane bullshit. And you would find some backwoods motherfuckers. Just so you know. But anyway, on September 17th in New Orleans, Louisiana, I managed Hercules Hernandez and Dr. Death against Hacksaw Duggan and Terry Taylor where, um, a Dr. Death smacked Terry Taylor with the helmet, and we beat oh. him one three. Is that the famous one? Like, they had the video of it because he got busted open? Uh, or it hit him in the eye? Been. Is that what it was? It may have been. Remember they used to do those videos in Mid-South, like, people say wrestling's fake. I'll show you how fake it is. And it would just be guys getting busted open. Oh, yeah. Thrown just on their head. stitches and <laughs> dropped on their head and fuck it. Yes. And then the main event that night was the Midnight Express against the Fantastics for the Mid-South Tag Team title with no disqualification. And it was a wild fucking melee. And then, as I recall, I think this was, I think Dundee was off and this was a Grizzly Smith finish because Bobby Fulton went to give Bobby Eaton an atomic drop and he had to do it close enough to the ropes that I could jump up on the apron and push Bobby Eaton's feet and he fell backwards on Bobby Fulton, one, two, three. That was the finish of a no disqualification match. That's why I think I think Grizzly may have been filling in. So this is September in New Orleans. When was the angle with the straight jackets? Uh the oh, no, the straight jackets are rock oh. and roll. The contract signing with the Fantastics with the uh the famous chair shots. Oh, with the chair shots. Yeah, because the straight jackets we did on TBS with the Fantastics. Yeah. Um, hold on here. Let me Go back to see if I can find the TV tapings. Uh, today, and we're already doing the deal with them. Ah, con replay contract signing in show 262. That means it was in show 261. So that had, that we had shot that August 29th, but it aired all, all through September at various points in the territory. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, what exactly you guys were doing. You know, this is a no DQ match. What would have set it up? That was one of the most well, vicious well, angles that people still talked about, those chair shots, seeing the dents in the chair. It's like the first time you ever saw that in wrestling. But what, uh, and because poor Bobby and Tommy were trying to get over like crazy, and they told Bobby, lay him in. But what set this up particularly was the September 3rd show in New Orleans. Um, that's the night that Hercules against Duggan with my hair versus Duggan's hair. <laughs> and Dr. Death was the referee and Doc and Duggan were friends, but I paid Dr. Death off. He switched heel and we fucked Duggan, but they came in the ring and goddamn shaved me anyway. We told that story. But earlier that night, uh, the Fantastics had wrestled the midnight and we had gotten disqualified. I can't read my writing anymore. Um, 
Ah, we got disqualified for Bobby throwing the powder at uh, Bobby Fulton, but hitting the referee in the eyes instead. So we came back with a no DQ match that night on the 17th. Because it makes sense. Imagine that. Could you have done it another year if you hadn't gone to world class and you didn't have Mid Atlantic lined up? Could you have done the schedule? Are you young enough and had enough no. energy? Okay. No, I'm about to tell you why. Because here's the fucking rib as I went back and looked at this. I li- okay, that was September 17th, 1984. Do you know the previous day off that I had had in the Mid-South Wrestling Territory where I hadn't done a house show or a TV taping or a set of interviews or potentially all three in the same day? The previous, before September 17th, my previous day off. Spring. Oh, God damn it. Give me, just blurt a date out. Just blurt a date out. I'm trying to think, when was this? When was that? Early May. Well, thank you, Ed McMahon. June 18th. Damn it. July, August, three months before my birthday was the previous day I had off. Do you know what the next day off that I had after my birthday? And I didn't have my birthday off, but I'm saying the following. The next day off I had in Mid-South Wrestling after June 18th. No. October 14th. October 4th. Now, wait a minute. Hold on here, though, because I want to tell you. Does that automatically, I want to tell you. Does that automatically mean the same thing for Bobby and Dennis? No, because here was the problem. And also, I didn't take off all of October 14th. Let me tell you this. Let me talk to you. So in Mid-South, at that point over the summer, I'd started managing Hercules Hernandez, and then when he was partners with Dr. Death and Tags, I was working with them too when Doc had switched heel in the angle we just did, right? So if the Midnight got a precious day off, if Dr. Death or Hercules were booked, I still went. Also, at this period of time, Mid-South Wrestling was legitimately running a live event every night of the week, seven days a week, every day of the month. In addition to that, on Sunday, more often than not, I would say 80% of the time, it was a double shot, a two o'clock in the afternoon show, and then 7.30 at night in a different city. In addition to that, every Wednesday, no matter where we were booked on a Tuesday night, or no matter where we were booked on Wednesday night, every couple of weeks, it was in Shreveport for TV taping, but it could be 280 miles away in Greenwood, Mississippi, but all the top main event talent would be in Shreveport at the TV station from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. on Wednesdays to cut the local promos for all these live events we're doing. So you literally worked eight wrestling shows a week and did six hours of interviews every day or every Wednesday on a day you're also doing a show that night. And the double shot on Sunday. A double shot on Saturday was not unheard of, but not regular, thank God. But some weekends we did do four live events. And every two weeks was a TV taping where they did two one-hour TV programs. And if you were a main event guy, you often worked on both those shows, which meant that you would now have wrestled nine matches that fucking week. What about local promos? With the local promos, there was 20, did he have 20 or 22 TV markets? So you did 40 or 44 local promos every Wednesday. Two minutes each. And so with that schedule, I had started on June 18th. And by the way, we've talked about it. It was 3,000 miles a week a lot of times in a car. Uh, If you didn't fly to Oklahoma... It was 4,000 miles that week. And so you were, there was no goddamn time to think about what you were doing to realize that you shouldn't really be able to do this. I mean, just the week of August 6th through August 12th, 400 to 630, 730. um, Hold on. That's 400. 1130, 1330. 15 to 16. Oh, 
We did 1,600 miles that week, but that's because we flew from Little Rock through Oklahoma and back, or it would have been 3,000. So anyway, then the point is, on October 14th, we had a goddamn double shot. We had to go from Alexandria to Pine Bluff, Arkansas for an afternoon show, cage match against the Fantastics. That was 230 miles of two-lane road, so we'd have to leave at like 8 in the morning. And then on the way back, about 130 miles, we'd stop in Monroe and work against the Rock and Roll Express that night, and then I'd manage Duggan against Hercules. And then come another 100 miles back. So we would leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. We'd get back home about 1.30. But I had to call in sick because I couldn't drag myself out of bed to go to Pine Bluff. And I went to Monroe that night because, you know, I was booked. I had to. I didn't want to fucking get fired. I was already called in sick on the afternoon show. And I made two more fucking shows. New Orleans on Monday and Shreveport on Tuesday. And they actually, the Fantastics got five minutes with me on Tuesday night. And then we did interviews on Wednesday morning. And I said, I'm, I'd started feeling like 15 minutes after I got up in the morning, like I hadn't slept in three days. I had no, I couldn't get up off the couch. I couldn't open my eyes. I was nodding when I was standing up and I was having this pain in my abdomen. And so they said, don't go to Lafayette, go to the fucking doctor. So I went home to Alexandria, went to the doctor, and they told me I had mono. And I don't know if they even still have that. You don't hear about it anymore. But mono. No, they still have it. They, do I, they? I, yeah. Um, my older daughter, she knows a kid who just went to the hospital, got mono. Well, you know, they used to call it when I was a kid, the kissing disease, because you could transmit it. It's something with your immune system. I, this is 40 years ago. I saw this fucking doctor in Alexandria. I don't know. He could have been a goddamn veterinarian. But it's an immune system thing or whatever. Your immune system gets worn down. I don't fucking know. They said my pain in my abdomen was from my internal organs swelling. And blah, blah, blah. And we narrowed it down because Terry Taylor at the same time took a month off almost because he had mono. <laughs> and I knew that I had not kissed Terry Taylor nor him me. But we narrowed it down at the interview sessions on Wednesdays at Channel 3 in Shreveport. The only place to get anything to drink they had in the break room, they had a goddamn Coke machine. And it was one of those fucking, the old time machines, it wasn't cans and it wasn't plastic. They didn't have plastic bottles with screw off caps. It was the goddamn, remember those thin, tall, like 10 or 12 ounce Pepsi bottles? Are you old enough? For I that? know what you're talking about. Sure. Okay. With the, you got bottles out of the machine and all the boys had bottles of soft drinks sitting on their tables when they're doing promos. And I swear to God. I either I drank Terry's or he drank mine, and we got the same goddamn thing. You didn't think maybe it was a girl? Oh, for heaven's sake. I wouldn't... He, we had much different taste back in those days. Just there was like a kissing bandit running around? Well, no, there was no, there was no kisses stolen. They were freely given away. Do you, um, when you did the five minutes with the manager, if you're the heel, that means you're doing all the bumping, all the selling, everything. Does it take forever, like in your head? Is it five minutes or is it an hour? No, because it don't last five minutes. Unless, here's the thing. It's usually, it's not a tag team usually. We did at the Great American Bash. Both the Fantastics got me. And I think Tommy punched me and Bobby slammed me and they double clotheslined me and beat me one, two, three. When it's a single heel against the manager, then that's when the manager, to Shane Douglas's great consternation, throws powder in his eyes and chokes him with a rope and gets some steam for about a minute and a half for two minutes so that people can get pissed off so that then he can clear his eyes and make the comeback like Ronnie Garvin did in the matches we've talked about and fucking beat me by throttling me around my neck and having my shoulders pinned so it's not like he's not even really finished with me yet, but boom, we get out of it and I'm drug out. You get out quick. So it doesn't last five minutes, except if the manager is somehow going to 
prevail in some freaky way. But nevertheless, where I prevailed was home for a week. This is the longest besides surgery that I ever had to take off of wrestling because I was sick. Seven days. They told Terry Taylor take a month off, and I think he did, because and also he was a wrestler. They told the doctor said you need to take a month off. You need to get as much rest as possible. You need to eat a healthy diet. Because imagine what our diet was like at that point. Mine especially. Yeah, Terry Taylor was in good shape. Yeah, but imagine what what mine was like in those fucking thousands of miles in the car and this fucking schedule. I was I, every in Alexandria, every lunch I had was either McDonald's chicken nuggets or from goddamn 7 Eleven every day of my fucking life. So they said, take a month off, get rest, eat a healthy diet, take vitamins. You know, there's no cure for this. I said, ah, I, I'll see what I can do. So I took off Lafayette, Louisiana, La Ronja, thank God, Hamburg, Arkansas, Little Rock. God damn it, Oak City and Tulsa, it killed me too. And Lake Charles and Baton Rouge. No, Baton Rouge, we were already off, thank God. I would have got a day off. And I went back to interviews and Shreveport TV on the 24th because that was the goddamn straight jacket angle with the Rock and Roll Express. And so I had to be there. And after seven days of sitting in the house, eating healthy as I could and sleeping, I went back to work and I did another, let's see, that's one week. That's, uh, you know what? That's, uh, I worked another two weeks straight and then we started having a couple of days off because we, by November, we were about ready to finish up. But they almost killed me. That was over a hundred and something days in a row of doing those trips and those shows and getting bumped around and sweating the summer in goddamn Louisiana and the Gulf of Texas and eating like shit and hardly ever sleeping and screaming for fucking hours at a time. <laughs> it almost killed me. That was 1984. Well, don't worry, 85, at least the first half of 85, you got to uh, get some rest. Well, that's the thing is, uh, that's why when we went to Dallas and realized what the money was like, we weren't happy with the money, but the schedule was, it was almost like we existed again. Uh, we went to restaurants and, you know, had days where we just sat around the house and watched TV and things were close. We didn't have to drive two hours to, you know, Alexandria, Louisiana, 40 years ago was not a goddamn happening location, and I'm not even, I'm, you know me, I'm not a disco pro. I couldn't go to the fucking movies there, not only because we didn't have time, but if somebody recognized me, they'd have jumped me in a fucking theater. But in Dallas, you could go to the fucking movie and reasonably expect that probably in the dark, most people ain't gonna, even though you're on TV, it's Dallas, they're not gonna really think you're gonna be there, they're not, and they're not gonna harass you because the Dallas Heels didn't have the heat in the Metroplex that the, any of the heels in Louisiana did. So we could go out in public and do shit. So we were there for six months, but finally we had to, we had to say sayonara, but guess where I was now? Bear in mind, at least in 84, I'm making fucking thousands of dollars a week. Right. And all those towns were fairly good in 1985, we had just started for Crockett. And you're in we Georgia. Were you're we were in still Georgia. in Georgia, yeah. right? The 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 moribund Georgia territory that was about to be absorbed into Charlotte. So on September 17th was a Tuesday in 85. I was in Chattanooga. And the Midnight Express beat Pez Watley and the Italian Stallion. And the house in Chattanooga was $4,700, and we made 80 bucks. <laughs> was the Italian Stallion ever any good? No, Stal was a good guy. He was a funny guy. And people like the boys. I'm not like saying as a person. I mean, having him ring. around. Actually, if you went back and you, if, not if you went back, but if the Italian Stallion of 1985 
was a wrestler today, you would think, wow, that guy has great basics. Ed Boy, he's pretty good. Because it's, it, it was a whole different fucking, you were looking at everything with different eyes then. But, and also, Stal had the, the largest head on a human being in the fucking world. Yeah. And it, we used to joke that... That's what I look for in my baby faces. Well, no, that's the thing. The headlock was ineffectual because you couldn't reach around it. It was fucking... He used to drive Jimmy Valiant all the time. Jimmy would meet Stallion at this convenience store off of Highway 61 there in Charlotte to get, to, to get a ride to Rock Hill. It was 13 miles away. And we'd pass by on the way to Rock Hill. There'd be Boogie's car sitting in the fucking parking lot where Stallion had picked him up so he could drive him 13 miles. <laughs> and they used to... They used to go when they were going to the spot shows out in Western North Carolina or whatever. They had all these stops where they knew they had stopped before and they had encountered fans, fans that ran grocery stores, fans that ran restaurants, fans that ran convenience stores. And they knew the stores to stop at where these people would just give them bags of groceries or food or shit. Here, here. And so they paid for nothing. And so they'd have to go out of their way sometimes to hit these places, but they were off most of the main highways. But anyway, that's what I did in 1985. But the interesting thing was that week, that following Sunday, was the first ever Midnight Rock and Roll Express match in Charlotte at the Charlotte Coliseum. That Sunday, November, or not November, but September 22nd. Wow. So we, because that's the thing, Crockett knew that the Georgia office was about to close. We'd come there. First of July. It's now the middle of September. It it ain't working. He's gonna. Uh, he's. Uh, they had commitments because of what Oli had been doing in the office down there to, to run some of these buildings and run some of the Georgia spot shows. So they had to honor them. But as they were finishing that up, there was no reason to keep that guys down there anymore. And we talked about they were given the Sawyers their fucking notice. Um, the previous day, Monday, September 16th, in Unadilla, Georgia. Unadilla, Georgia. A $2,500 house, and the payoff was $60. And it was supposed to be Buzz Sawyer and the Raging Bull against the Midnight. I think Bull wasn't there, so Bobby had a single match with Buzz Sawyer and beat him. And Buzz was not happy about doing those jobs. And then we did Chattanooga. Then they brought us up to Raleigh and Madison Heights, Virginia and Columbia, South Carolina and Charleston. The rest of that week, we're starting to go into the North Carolina, into the territory. But that Sunday, the 22nd, here's a fucking deal. We start out with, I'm at Atlanta TV that morning because we're still living in Georgia. We're still living in Atlanta. And we're not going to move until the first week of October. So they have the Midnight Express booked against the Italian Stallion. And oh my God, what was Reeves? What was his first name? Local guy. Anyway, just to get them over in Asheville, North Carolina, it's their first appearance. But I need to be on Atlanta TV. So after Charleston, South Carolina, I drove back to goddamn Atlanta, 260 miles. And then uh, fucking did Atlanta TV the next morning and then drove up to Charlotte where we did the rock and roll match that night at the Coliseum and then back to Atlanta where meanwhile the midnight had gone from Charleston, the farthest you can go in South Carolina, all the way to one of the most westernmost parts of North Carolina for an afternoon show and then gone back to Charlotte the wrong way and then had to go back to Atlanta that night. There you go. What about 1986? 1986, that was the best year ever for Crockett Promotions. And do you know where I was and where I was working on September 17, 1986? I mean, I could just pick a town unless it's something like outside that would be like painful, like Kansas City or something. No, I wasn't working at all. We were at the NWA convention in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, wow. 
And this was the rib, you know, we've talked about it. Every year, the National Wrestling Alliance, since it had been formed, had an annual convention. All the promoters got together. They brought their top guys, their top talent, either their bookers or the people they were lobbying for to potentially be the world champion. Only the top talent and the, you know, the big promoters went to the NWA meeting, right? And that's where they picked the world champion and they, you know, got together, did all their how to get out of antitrust issues and all that other stuff. That's where the business was done, right? Well, by 1986, Crockett is pretty much the NWA. And, you know, there's there's a few other member promoters, and I think Baba was still involved, obviously. And so Crockett just decided he was going to decide where the meeting was. It was going to be in Las Vegas. And as a present, he was going to take like the top 16 guys, 18 guys or whatever on the roster and fly us all out to Las Vegas for three days to have the NWA convention meeting. And so that's the first time I went to Las Vegas. It was the 15th, 16th, and 17th, a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because he didn't want to give up any fucking weekends where, you know, he could actually gross some money. But so that's the first time I got to go to Las Vegas, and that's why it was just a vacation for all the boys. And they did the same thing next year, as we'll talk about in a second, but they could, they uh, convened a meeting with everybody there and passed a couple of fucking whereases and then unconvened and spent the rest of the next three days just jacking around in Las Vegas. And, and Crockett wrote the fucking deal off. <laughs> it was a tax expense. It was the annual meeting of the NWA. Uh, Jim Crockett knew what he was doing with money and taxes, of course. Just write it off. Just just, just write it off. How much is that jet? I just, just write it off. Yeah. Just write it off. So... So anyway, I mean, and I was never a gambler, but I liked, I got to like the video poker. That's, that's why Flair one year, he got me this little desktop video poker machine because I, that's every time he'd see me in Las Vegas, I was playing the video poker. And we, I, I, with my, I didn't have Stacy at the time. I would have been in jail. She would have been like eight. Um, but my first wife, we went to Hoover Dam and Lake Me. I took pictures took picture that the strip was still, it wasn't all the mega resorts back then. It was still like the sands and the dunes and Caesar's palace. And it still felt like the rat pack. Yes. You could see the goddamn, the same, they had the same neon, the same signs as the classic street pans that they would do. So I took and still have pictures of all of that shit. And of you know, Murdoch had told me, you got to go to the to the steakhouse at Circus Circus, and I did, and oh my God, it was incredible. And all the old shit. He knew he knew uh, Benny Binion, him Murdoch himself. Every time he went to Las Vegas, he got comped whatever at Binion's. Did you take a camera with you everywhere you went, or was it just for this special occasion? No, because it was Las Vegas. No, on the fuck, I wouldn't have had the camera long if I took it on a lot of these trips. But because it was Las Vegas, yes, you know, did that and. uh and ended up having a just a fine old time there, and then came back <laughs> on the 18th, the day after my birthday, we came all the way from Las Vegas to Green Bay, Wisconsin, for a world tag title match with the Rock and Roll Express. But that, um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, that weekend was the big street fight match with Dusty Rhodes and Bubba Rogers in Greensboro. We got a thousand dollar payoff on. And then did Atlanta TV and Charlotte on the Sunday after our debut in Bloomington. It was quite the travel uh, at that point. But You know what else happened on that day in 1986? What? The Mets clinched the National League East. And we were at the Mets Center in Bloomington. Dwight Gooden beat the Chicago Cubs uh, the way things should be. And the Mets and the fans stormed the field for the last time ever in New York sports because... They destroy Shea Stadium And then so they put badly. up a fence, right? <laughs> well, no, it, you know what? It creates such an ugly visual. The Mets, when they win in 86, and basically every New York team after, well, New York baseball team, the Mets are the Yankees, they win. As soon as they win, the gates open, and cops on horses come riding <laughs> down the line. Like, you're not getting past that, you know? 
And then you get to see like past the cops and the horses your team's celebrating. <laughs> but you don't get to go on the field and body check them and steal their hat and eat mud and all the things that people used to do. Homie, eat mud. Let's go Mets. Well, you know, but now I'm 25 years old, Brian, in 1986. Thankfully, you could argue. You could rent a car back then. I never had anybody argue with me renting a car. I rented all the, all the cars for the midnight and had been doing that for the previous couple of years. Nobody ever said a goddamn word. But now it was legal, I guess. I gave you a little preview, but where do you think I was in 1987? You were at the NWA convention in uh, Charlotte. No. I was at the NWA convention in St. fucking Martin. Oh, wow. And oh, yeah, wow. Now, here's the goddamn deal. Write it off. Just write it off. Yeah, well, anyway, I'm about to write this fucking place <laughs> off. <clears throat> so what had happened was we had had a nice little round the world. This was when Crockett had bought the UWF and he was running more different towns, right? So we had gone to Memphis on the 11th. $20,000 house because we couldn't draw in Memphis because Lawler wasn't involved. With the Midnight Express and Bubba Rogers against Dr. Death and the Road Warriors with me and Skandor Akbar in a small cage. And uh, all the stars, Memphis sucked. Then we go to St. Louis and it's a $55,000 house. Uh, Dusty and Hawk against the Midnight Express because Animal was for some reason injured. And then we went to Cincinnati for one of the worst houses in the history of Cincinnati, Ohio, $9,600. And we were against Jimmy Valiant and Kendall Wyndham for the U.S. tag team title. So then we all leave for St. Martin, which I don't know how to describe for the people who don't know where it is, where the fuck it is. St. Martin is down. Can you describe where St. Martin is? It's an island. It's an island. In the, in the Atlantic, island area, yeah. It down, it's not Puerto Rico. It's not. It's somewhere. I don't fucking know. Think you know the song Kokomo? Yeah, there are they in there too. It's implied. Bermuda, Jamaica. It's implied. Saint Martin's implied. I believe the West is. Indies is that somewhere near? I don't think that's in the song either. No. John Stamos. I'm talking is in the about song. is is the West Indies near Saint Martin? Which West Indies? The real ones or the ones Columbus thought the he was? The real ones. Oh, okay. I don't know. The point is, look it up, folks. But M-A-A-R-T-E-N, St. Martin. <laughs> point is, they've got the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th, and they're doing the NWA meeting and the same thing. Crockett's going to fly the top 18, 20 guys. It was me, it was Bobby, it was Stan, Flair, the Road Wars were there, Dusty was there, JJ was there, Tully was there. The whole goddamn... Shitting, shooting, shitting match, whole goddamn shooting match of the top guys. He's going to fly to St. Martin for four days. And I'm here in Flair because Flair's been down there, right? But then I should have realized he, he went back after he goddamn nearly got killed wrestling Jack Venino down there to that part of the world. Well, that was the Dominican Republic. Well, same goddamn thing. No. It's in that direction. They're all very different. Well, I don't... <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if somebody almost didn't get killed in St. Martin. But the point is, they've been saying, oh, it's great. It's an island. It's a resort area. It's an island. It's tropical. I'm thinking Hawaii, right? Because that year in 87, when I got married, went on my honeymoon, went to Hawaii. Look at this guy. Regular, regular Colin Thompson over here flying well, all yeah. around. So I'm thinking now Crockett's going to get, and, and he paid for the tickets for you and your wife, right? So I'm thinking, well, well this will be fun. It'll be like Hawaii. Oh, no, it wasn't. No matter how much flair and these guys that have been there and worked Florida territory, whatever, promoing it, we get there. It's not like Hawaii. It's not low humidity and pleasant weather. It's oppressive fucking heat and it's air you wear. And whereas in Hawaii, they had even the Denny's restaurant didn't have a wall on it. They just want all the open air because they don't have bugs. They don't have snakes. Whatever the fuck they got on this goddamn island, you need to watch out for it. And, and uh, chances are the insects can carry you off. More on that in a minute. Just going from the airport to our resort area, we're passing neighborhoods where there are junked cars 
in the front yards with goats standing on them so that they can eat leaves out of the trees without having to stand up on their hind legs. Kind of fucking neighborhoods. What's wrong with that? Do you have that up there in Jersey near the last manor? No, but, you know, it could take Goats off. on junked cars eating out of the trees? Well, there are goats that climb trees. I've seen that, but... um. You know why they were eating out of the trees? Because the food that they served you would make you sick down there. Because it made me sick, and I had a cast iron fucking facility at that point in time. And here's something else. They don't give you hotel rooms, and they don't really give you your own cabin. They have these beachfront cabana cabin type things where there's two individual rooms or areas for people. And they have a common porch, right? And the first night that I'm there, we walk back from dinner or whatever the fuck, because they said, don't leave the resort. The resort area is okay. You don't want to go into town unless you want to buy some discount electronics. But Sounds like Jamaica. daytime. Sounds like Jamaica. Yeah. So we come back to this porch, and I see a goddamn spider the size of my hand on the door of the room right next to ours on this combined porch, and I grab a goddamn stick and whack this spider, and it just drops down, shakes its head, sells momentarily, and runs under the crack in the door to the room next to us that I don't know whether somebody's in there sleeping or not. <laughs> and I'm like, I've gotten it now. I've forced a goddamn potentially poisonous spider into their goddamn room. It's like a Bond movie. And I'm like, open our door, I can naturally say nothing, get inside. And then I look and I realize there's a goddamn inch high crack under the door, the door to the front porch, out into the tropics, into the jungle, into naked and afraid country. There's a fucking inch crack under the fucking door. And that's why apparently they've got the heavy duty can of bug spray that came in the room. It was already in there. So I've spent the entire time we were in the room stuffing goddamn towels under that crack in the door and spraying them, soaking them with bug spray. I'm not even going to mention. <laughs> that sounds hazardous. Well, it, and it, it was hard to breathe, but I didn't want to open a goddamn window. A goddamn tsetse <laughs> fly or a fucking vampire <laughs> bat may fly in. <laughs> Then my wife wanted to take the fucking boat trip where they're going to cook us a goddamn... What's that French culinary school? The Cordon Bleu. Right, of course. They're going to, a Cordon Bleu chef is going to take us on a boat to a sandbar and cook us a goddamn Cordon Bleu meal. Well, the, I don't know about the Cordon, but the meal blew, all right. It was, the portions were so tiny and the food was so greasy that I ended up on a sandbar with no bathroom and no toilet on this fucking boat that had no cover on it, which led to the fucking worst sunburn I'd ever gotten in my life. And that's when I believe I told you one time I had to go across the fucking sand dune and take a angry fucking Russo and wipe my ass with my fucking tube sock. <laughs> and then came back just in time to goddamn feel the sunburn that I couldn't even have sheets on my body and then we got a to-go cheeseburger they put goat cheese on it i thought the meat was ruined i threw the whole thing out and then realized it was some kind of goat cheese that these fucking perverted twisted <laughs> deviant minds down here give to people unsuspecting when they think they're gonna get a piece of regular cheese on a goddamn burger they've just asked to take home to their fucking infested with insects <laughs> fucking deadly fucking poisonous room where they can lay there and shiver and be in pain and blister and their skin peel off their body but no i got goat cheese and i threw the burger out the window because i thought the meat was ruined <laughs> and then we came back to pittsburgh <laughs> So that was, that was 1987 in St. Martin at the NWA meeting. And again, by the way, they here now the people at this resort, right? And they're used to, I guess, these businesses coming and doing this thing. So they send at nine o'clock the first morning or whatever, they send uh, 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 vans, shuttles to pick everybody up at the 
at the uh, front desk check-in area and then take them over to the meeting room and we go in the meeting room and these long tables where everybody can sit at and then you've got the table with a screen uh, like if they want to use a projector you can pull the screen down and the podium at the front and they've got notepads with pens next to all the chairs and they've got a pitcher of water on every table and glasses and they sit Dan Crockett's got I'm, I'm sure Elliot Murnick was there and probably Carl Murnick and and the local promoters not Henry Marcus never made it to any of these and they call briefly the meeting to order and most of the talent is not involved in anything we're just sitting there and they made a couple of motions and passed the motions and then they got on the fucking house phone and they called the guy that's from the hotel, from the resort back. Can you come back? And he comes in like five minutes later, say, yes, you need something. They said, we're done oh, for the day. No, for the whole fucking time. That was the goddamn convention meeting. And they wrote the rest of it off and guys are doing jet skis and they're fucking riding around a motorcycle and they're drinking at the cabana bar and they're going into town for cheap electronics. And I'm trying to evade goddamn poisonous fucking reptiles and insects and couldn't wait to get the fuck out of that place and would never, ever think about going there ever again. Well, don't worry. There was no NWA convention to attend at 88. And there sure wasn't. But I'll tell you where I was in 1988 on September 17th. I'll have you know. I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And the Midnight Express was doing a job for the Road Warriors. The house was $41,000, and we got $415 a piece. <laughs> wow. $415. That's cutting it right down to the nub, as Dennis used to say. That's where they say, well, we've given you everything we can. Because then one time in world class, he got a $63 payoff because he worked the tag match and the captain's match. So we got $50, but for the extra singles match, he got 13 fucking dollars on a spot show. But this week was a little bit more noteworthy than just being in Charleston, South Carolina. Would you like to know what I did my entire birthday week in 1988? The entire week? Well, just because it's, it's it, I'm not going to go into granular detail, but it was very eventful because, as you'll recall, the week before that, Saturday, September 10th, we went to Philadelphia and did a little thing called beating Tully and Arn for the World Tag Team title. That's right. That was completely unplanned because of obviously Tully and Arn's situation. And we covered that here not long ago. As a matter of fact, there had been a clash of champions live on TBS on September 7th. They didn't put that match on there because Dusty didn't want the people to see it live on TV. He wanted them to pay to see it. And they were, Richmond had been great and Greensboro was great and Norfolk was up and Baltimore did $123,000. Detroit did $70,000. We did a hundred and, what was it? 110 in Charlotte. But anyway, so our bookings that week, it's kind of weird because it reflects the fact that nobody knew this was coming. The, the night in Philly, the house was $72,000. That was about, for those days, 6,500, 7,000 people. Not great for Philly, but not horrible. We did that, and then the, the next day was a double shot. We did syndicated TV in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the NWA, uh, NWA Pro Show that would air on September 24th, so two weeks ahead of time. And uh, also the NWA Worldwide. So we did a match and an interview against Job Guys and just talked about winning the belts on both those shows because it had just happened. And then that night we were against the Fantastics in Greensboro where it, that, that was a substitution where it had been advertised Tully and Arn. And we had to do a, basically a double pin and the referee raised our hands, which was kind of the same thing we did with Tully and Arn, but that was because they're like, what the fuck? Now we are they baby faces or heels? What the fuck's going on? So then... Yeah, how did you work that match? Well, we had to kind of, even though... See, here's the problem. 
We had had the program with the Fantastics earlier in the year. All those great matches everybody remembers, the Clash of Champions, the one that FTR said was that they loved so much that uh, Meltzer said, uh, you know, was the best TV match until FTR and Bullet Club Gold. We'd done all that with us straight heels and them straight baby faces from March through July. Now we're coming back and rehashing when we've already done an angle with Tully and Arn and makes us baby faces. And to be honest, we had proven we could beat the mid, the Fantastics. And so the people were, they weren't hooting them out of the building, but they were either cheering for us or just kind of sitting on their hands about it. And that didn't make for a good atmosphere. And the people knew in the kind of way that the fans that even when they weren't smart back in those days knew that the Fantastics ain't going to win these things right now. It was a, It was thrown back with them just because there was nothing else right now. And so, when's, when's the New Orleans match with the Road Warriors? Uh, end of October, almost Halloween. So we had to be kind of floating for about six weeks. And that was the, the difficult part. <laughs> but, and that's, and here's another thing I mentioned, okay, we're in Philly on Saturday night. We win the belts. We go Sunday Fayetteville and do two hours of TV taping in the afternoon and a house show in Greensboro that night. I had already scheduled myself. That's the week that I did the fill-in morning shows on WBCY Radio in Charlotte with J.J. McKay, who was the afternoon guy. The morning team was on vacation. So four out of five of the mornings this week, I was already committed to doing fucking four hours of morning radio. So I'm getting up at four o'clock in the morning to drive over to the station, right, and be there by the time we go on at six o'clock. So I've done Philly, we're on Crockett's plane, we've flown back to done Fayetteville and Greensboro on Sunday, I do the morning radio on Monday, then I go to Greenville, South Carolina that night, we work a title match with the Fantastics where we go over, then I get home fucking midnight, 1230, I'm up at four again, I do the morning radio on Tuesday. Then we do another TV taping in Columbia, South Carolina on Tuesday night where we do not only two TV shows, but also a dark match with the Fantastics. Then back to Charlotte, which is an hour and a half, so I'm home by 1130. But then the next morning, I do the radio again and then drive to Atlanta. And this was where they started doing Atlanta TV on weekday nights for whatever fucking bizarre purpose. So we're still at the studio. We're not at center stage yet, but we have Atlanta TV on Wednesday night and Thursday night. And I couldn't go back to Charlotte and do this. So I called in on the phone for a while on the radio show on Thursday morning. And then after the taping on Thursday night, I drove back to Charlotte and did the morning radio on Friday morning, six to 10 again. And then got in the car and we went to Richmond, Virginia, which was 300 fucking miles. And did a match that was supposed to be with Tully and Arn and worked with the Fantastics. And then went to Charleston that Saturday, my birthday, the match with the Road Warriors. And then we're in Roanoke, Virginia, which is almost as far as you can get in the territory from Charleston, South Carolina on Sunday the 18th, where we were back working with the Fantastics instead of as a replacement for Tully and Arn. So that was an interesting fucking week. Did you have to clear that with the office, or they don't care what kind of things you do like that in your office? Well, no, well, no here's the thing. We were in Charlotte, right? So obviously, Tom Sorensen at the Charlotte Observer was doing the regular wrestling column in the newspaper, which was at the time may still be the biggest newspaper in the state at a regular wrestling column. All the guys were, were encouraged to do publicity. They were celebrities. And so when, um, when they asked me from, because Cat Collins had, been, had worked for that radio station also, and they knew that their morning team would, uh, was going to go on vacation. And I think it may, it may have been Cat said, so I think he was there then. Uh, but he may have said something about, I get a cornet. Oh, yeah. So they asked me to do it, and they had the regular afternoon guy switch to mornings because he knew how to work all the shit. And they just said, just be yourself. So I told 
you know, Crockett and Dusty, I said, I'm going to be the morning guy on the fucking, one of the most popular radio stations in town for a week. And they said, yes, sell the matches, plug the fucking shit. And I did. I, I talked about the Midnight Express, talked about the matches, talked about the wrestling program. Any they guests? Care. Any guests? Did you ask Flair to come on or anything? Uh, but what? No. Are you? None of those guys were going to get up and come up in there with that schedule that early in the fucking morning. No. And I, I didn't have Not the in the power. studio, but even if they call in. Well, but I'm, I didn't, they didn't give me the power to invite people and program the whole thing. I'm, I'm sidekicking the fucking afternoon guy. And we came up with bits as we went. We actually did call U.S. Air because U.S. Air had a hub in Charlotte at that point in time. And that was the big airline. They had absorbed Piedmont Airlines and everything. And we said, we're calling from WBCY Radio, our regular morning guys. I can't remember their name, Frick and Frack. They're going to be flying back in from their vacation next Monday. Can you reroute all incoming planes from California to fucking Beckley, West Virginia? And then we're going to strand them up there and sort it out later so we can keep doing the show. And this was live on the, 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 the U.S. Air people didn't see the humor in that situation. Maybe you didn't either. Welcome to the U.S. Air. It was funnier when we did it. <laughs> Well, happy happy that birthday. Was, yeah, yeah. Well, you want to go any further? I got more. 89. Hold on. Babyface Jim Cornette in 89. Let's go to 1989, because on September 17th, we were in El Paso, Texas, working with the Freebirds of Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin in a house that, on a house that was so bad that it's, I didn't even record it for a $150 payoff. Cause of course that Ooh. was the, well, but here's the thing. We were all on guarantees. This was the Turner broadcasting days, the TBS, the Jim Hurd era. So they would give you a payoff on the show based on what the payoff would be. If it was the house that you drew, like in the old days, but you were still on a guaranteed fucking contract anyway. So all the payoffs were abysmal. Nobody, the Memphis crew wouldn't have worked WCW for the payoffs if they didn't have guarantees. Because all, listen to this. We're, hold on. We had done, and this was when Flair had just strong-armed his way into the book and taken over the booking team. Because so the that means you're on the booking team. Exactly. I had just started because it, everything was abysmal, right? I will, I'll just start at the first of September. Um, it was a, it, we were in Nashville, Tennessee on Labor Day. Didn't even record the house. We had $200 payoff. Huntsville, Alabama, $23,000, 200 bucks. Alexandria, Louisiana, $200. Biloxi, Mississippi, 25 grand. All these Midnight Express versus the Freebirds, the two hottest teams ever in mid-south wrestling nobody wanted to see any of this shit miami florida did fifteen thousand dollars for midnight versus the Freebirds and me versus paul Heyman. i'm uh, i can't imagine that the uh the building wasn't fifteen thousand dollars rent then we went to palmetto florida and did 15 7 and then fort pierce florida couldn't even record the house. A $250 payoff. The contract payment for me alone that week was $2,800. So that was the, the shortfall. And what? Greenwood, South Carolina, $11,000. Columbia, South Carolina, this is where I was going. September 12th was the Clash of Champions Fall Brawl. It was the eighth Clash of Champions. That's where Flair put me and Jim Ross in on color for the clash of champions episodes and that's where he really started redirecting the 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 creative for the pay-per-views and the the shows the booking etc but we were still in a horrendous position with the live dates the live tours and events uh we were supposed to be in warner robbins georgia on september 13th they just canceled it and then we did Atlanta TV on Thursday the 14th. And then they sent us to Corpus Christi, Texas, on Friday the 15th. They had a full card of all these guys that were on $1,500, $2,000, $2,500, $3,000 a week guarantees. 
And we sold out the old building in Corpus Christi, but it was $28,000 house. They lost money on a sellout. And then we went to Lubbock and did $12,000 on Saturday the 16th. And then on Sunday, we were in, in El Paso for the 17th and did, again, it's $150 payoff. And I'm not even recording these houses. They're abysmal. They're literally like 1,000 people. 1,500 people, 750 people. And the 18th, we were in Roanoke, Virginia for a TV taping. The 19th, we were off. The 20th, we did Atlanta TV. The 21st, we were off. The 22nd, finally, we were in Asheville, North Carolina, did a $41,000 house. And... That was, uh, but uh, we were supposed to work with the Freebirds, but Garvin was hurt, so it was a single match with Stan and Michael Hayes. And then we were supposed to go to Richmond on Saturday the 23rd, but the plane was canceled, and we were supposed to be in Charlotte on the 24th, but the show was canceled because do you remember what happened then, Brian? What happened? September 1989. I don't remember. Hurricane Hugo. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the storm canceled the Charlotte show on the 24th. And then we picked up Johnstown, Pennsylvania on the Monday, the 25th for another TV taping. So this was just, it was incredible. We, they, they went to Worcester, Massachusetts with a full WCW card on a Wednesday night and did $7,100. As that was so bad that they didn't even give the contract guys a token payoff on that town. They lost so much money, they had to buy their way out of the building that night. So they didn't even have anything to record a token payoff for the talent out of that show. And then we were in Troy, New York the next day, not for the clash, Syracuse, New York, and Buffalo and Rochester. And the only fucking town that drew was Buffalo, and drawing for that was $32,000. And then we were in Salisbury, Maryland for another TV taping, and I remember riding with Flair and Kevin Sullivan where he was beyond ballistic about... He was getting the ratings up. The clash had been well-received, and the ratings that was up, and it looked good for creative and the pay-per-view and et cetera, but he wasn't in control of the goddamn towns. And he said, we could go to Gaffney, South Carolina and draw better than we were in Worcester fucking Massachusetts. And we'd be an hour from the house. And, it, you know, so that was the, the problem is WCW, they couldn't put live events together to save their lives. And the towns that they picked, I think somebody told me at one point were based off the local ratings they did in that town rather than whether anybody in that town might buy a ticket to see them live. It was all about TV for them. And they ignored all the great drawing towns that we had traditionally gone to, the ones they hadn't already killed, to go to these new markets where they say, oh, but people are watching us. Yeah, well, they ain't coming to buy a ticket. Maybe it's because you can't promote a show. Maybe it's because nobody knows we're here. Maybe it's because you're going to a building so big that 2,000 people looks like a piss hole in a snowbank. Talking to Jim Herder, Tony. I was about to say, 35 years later, people still haven't learned. How about 1990 is a good one? Okay. 1990, Flair has already said fuck it and quit the book, <laughs> as you'll recall. Told, I wrote his letter for him, told her, fuck it, you promised me control. And That was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, that, well, that was in February, and then I followed in March. And then the Midnight and I tried to leave in May, but every, all the agents and everybody on the booking committee overruled Herd and voted unanimously to offer us a new contract, so we were stuck. So we were trying to make the best of it. So now Ole is booking because they've gone through another committee and then they brought Ole back. And as you will recall, um, Ole decided, well... Herd don't like him, and I ain't going to die on that hill, so I'm just either going to beat him or not use him at all. So we had a lot more time off over that period of time. 
But for example, again, in the 10 days before my birthday, starting with September 7th, we were in Amarillo, Texas, against Hector Guerrero and Terry Taylor. $250 payoff. Again, we're on guaranteed contracts, but this shows that none of these towns are drawing any money. I don't even have the houses recorded. I wasn't interested enough to stay to the end of some of these shows to see what the fucking figure was. Then we were in Lubbock, Texas on the 8th, same thing, Fort Worth on the 9th. The payoff was worse. My contract payment that week, or that uh, period, was $3,394. That meant for that two-week period, they were $3,400 short on what they owed me just on the payoffs I had from the house shows. Then we came back and did Gainesville, Georgia TV on Monday the 10th. And then we were booked for Dayton, Ohio on the 11th, Canton, Ohio on the 12th, and Portsmouth, Ohio on the 13th. And I wrote here that I was pissed off, pissed in parentheses. I called them and said, fuck you, I'm sick. Because <laughs> I was mad. And I didn't go. And they didn't care. That's how bad it was getting at that point. But then finally, I believe I talked myself into going back on the road and showed up in Columbus on the 14th and as another $200 payoff. And then we were in Detroit, Michigan on the, third, on the uh, 15th of September, Brian. Detroit, Michigan, the house was $13,000. That was not 1,000 people. And we worked with poor Brian Pillman and Tom Zink. And then the next day we were in Hammond, Indiana. And that wasn't even $13,000, right? And again with Pillman and Zink. And so we're either being beaten like a drum or a lot of times we would show up for tag matches with people, but the other, the opponents wouldn't give a fuck enough to show up at this point. So they just have us in single matches and nothing's going on, right? And I'm getting cranky. And then we show up on Monday, September 17th in Marietta, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta for another TV taping because at that that's all the fuck we were doing at that point was these TV tapings. And, and then going to tours in some part of the country where nobody was fucking coming, right? But at least we're either off more... <laughs> Or we've only got one match a night or, you know, we're not killing ourselves because there's nobody there watching. But on my birthday, we get to Marietta. Guess how many matches we had in one night at a TV taping? Three. Five. Wait a minute. Hold on. Well, let me make sure I'm right. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, I'm right. Because do you remember when they had the Friday night power hour on TBS and the Saturday night WCW show and Sunday night's main event? It was a Jim Ross idea, bless his little heart, that some wrestler would be chosen to try to run, run the, gauntlet. the gauntlet. Yeah, you got to run the gauntlet. That's right. And if he beat somebody on Friday night <laughs> and Saturday night and Sunday night, he would win a goddamn cash prize or a brand new car or some fucking blow job from, I don't know, whatever. And so on this night, they were taping not only the three W uh, uh, or TBS shows for the weekend, but we were also booked in a dark match and also, they were doing syndication and wanted to stand to work a single match. So, on the Bobby Eaton is running the gauntlet. On the Power Hour, he has a match with Tracy Smothers. And another, uh, a baby face, right? Because we're fucking, at this point, we're heels again. And Tracy goes to come off the top rope, and I shake the rope, and Tracy falls, and Bobby pins him. So Bobby advances. And then on the Saturday night show, it's Bobby Eaton versus Ricky Morton. And they do a 15-minute Broadway. And then it's announced there's going to be a five-minute overtime. And Stan comes to the ring and distracts the referee, and I hold the fucking tennis racket 
into the corner for Bobby to run Ricky, but Ricky shoves Bobby into it and then nails me and then crossbodies Bobby. But the referee turns around and sees me laying there. And as he comes to me, Stan gets up and Ricky grabs him and Bobby gives St uh, Ricky a knee in the back. And Ricky and Stan have a double knockout and Bobby schoolboys Ricky and advances. And then he advances to the Sunday night main event show where now it's Bobby Eaton versus Sid Vicious. And this was the worst Bobby Eaton match I've ever seen. And he tried his best, but it was Sid. And Sid went over, obviously. The whole thing was to get Sid over and to have Bobby provide 45 fucking minutes of goddamn programming over the weekend in one night. And I mean, Sid was so stiff and so fucking fired up at himself at that point when he was so green. He did the deal where he shoved me, and he shoved me so hard I was flying so far back I did what you never do because I was panicked. I'd never gone this fast before, and I put my hands behind my back to catch myself and almost hyperextended my elbow from a fucking chest shove, right? So Bobby had to put him over. Then we also, Stan, as I mentioned, had a singles match in syndication with Terry Taylor where Terry Sunset flipped him and beat him. And then... We had a dark match against Rick and Scott Steiner where we did the same finish that we had done in the Meadowlands in August when we dropped the U.S. Tag Team title to them, and that was the main event dark match. So five fucking matches in one night in Marietta at the Cobb County Civic Center. <sighs> and then that week we were back in Jasper, Georgia and Rock Hill, Sa Rock Hill, South Carolina did a $3,000 house. That means that the ticket prices that WCW was charging at that point, they didn't have 250 people. And you would leave WCW a little while after that and you would start Smoky Mountain in 92. So 91, you're working indie dates, you're setting up Smoky. Where were you on your birthday? I was not anywhere on 19 because in 1991, if I went through and counted, which I haven't, besides the Memphis dates that we did in January, February, and into March, I may have worked six or eight shows in 1991. And I was nowhere on my boy's day, but I was in 1993. I was somewhere in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Remember when I said that September 1993 was the worst after I'd set the record for the best Smoky Mountain house in August of 93 with me and Bullet Bob in the Lumberjack match, then September was the worst, and it was Bob and Terry Funk because the psychology was off. They didn't want to see me get revenge on Bob. They wanted to see me, him get revenge on me, and they did. But we had to start something else. Well, in September, I was not going to ask Terry Funk to fly from Amarillo, Texas to Johnson City, Tennessee for a Saturday show, he'd had to leave at fucking Thursday at 2 o'clock, right? Because we had Johnson City running at Freedom Hall as a Friday night. September 17th, we did a $2 kids ticket because September, back to school, they got to buy the kids clothes and books and all that shit. It's always sucked. And... I had a regular card. We had the Heavenly Bodies against the Rock and Roll Express. We had the Armstrongs against the Bruise Brothers, Tracy Smothers against Brian Lee for the Smoky Mountain title. But we also had a loser leave Smoky Mountain wrestling match between Bob Armstrong and Jim Cornette's secret weapon. Because I had to fucking... I started the thing with, with Bob and Terry, but also I had to get Bob Armstrong out of Smoky Mountain so we could bring the bullet back, right? So Bob Armstrong says, I tell you what, I'll bring Larry Santo up with me. When Bob rode up, he picked up Larry Santo in Chattanooga. Larry Santo was a wrestler, but he wasn't working in Smoky Mountain at the time. Bob liked to work with him on the indie shows in Alabama, and he had a ninja outfit. So my black ninja beat Bob Armstrong so that Bullet Bob would have to come back with a mask on later on. Because we knew we were going to do what we were going to do, and we did 855 paid and 114 comps. 
And it, it, it sucked, but it got, we got the footage and it got the point across, but that's what I did my birthday that, that year. Is that a lot of comps for Johnson city? Uh, well, see, we had sponsors and radio. See, we got, normally we would have had 30 or 40 maybe because you give the radio station, like the country station, you give them 10 pair and they'll give them away. And then you give the rock station 10 pair and they'll give them away. And that's the most you're going to give away. But we had, and I'd have to go to the fucking event file, but in Johnson City, was it, oh, God damn it, who was it? We had Mrs. Winters in Knoxville. There was some sponsor that as part of them paying us money, we would provide them with X amount of tickets. So they weren't necessarily comped, but we pulled them without selling them through the box office. So that is, and technically that is a comp ticket. Nobody paid for it individually, but there is sometimes an asterisk there. And that may be something with the WWE also with the large number of comps when they've got Snickers all over their goddamn did they give the the Snickers factory 500 tickets to have all the kids come down and say, who knows, right? But to give that many, sometimes they're just papering, but we never, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, nor Ohio Valley Wrestling, or anything I was in charge of, we never papered specifically to look good because if it was that bad, it wasn't going to help us anyway, and we didn't want to set the precedent coming back to the same place constantly that you could get free tickets if 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 nobody bought them they'll give them away for free we don't want people to think that but if fucking classy motors or mrs winter's chicken or spectrum rents it might have been spectrum in johnson city spectrum rents we had a banner if they want to give us a thousand or two thousand dollars a month and they want 40 tickets to the show well, they're, they're going to have them in their store, and if somebody comes in and buys something, they're going to give them a free wrestling ticket. Well, that's not necessarily hitting our target audience necessarily, so it's not taking people away from us. Does that make any sense? Makes lots of sense. And as we've talked about on the all-in, all-out, were they all-in or all-out fiasco with the discrepancy in the attendance, a, lot, a high percentage of comp tickets don't come. because they got them from the radio station or they got them from a sponsor or they don't have anything invested. They may not be able to get a babysitter. They just, they wanted to call and answer the question, whatever the fuck, right? Cause there have been wrestling promotions before that have passed out like thousands of comp tickets, but ran a building that seated maybe 800 and still didn't have a riot because you're, you're hoping that maybe you get, 20% or 25% if you're just trying to paper something like that. But anyway, that was there. And then the following day, we were in Phelps, Kentucky. Oh, joy, oh, bliss. But that was 1993. I got, I got, well, hold on. I got two more. You want to hear two more? Yeah. Because 1994. Oh, Again. Oh, boy. <laughs> Smoky Mountain Wrestling. <laughs> well, no, it was better. It was better in a way. Because we didn't have a shitty show in Knoxville in September because we had realized from the previous two years that uh, back, and also the Tennessee Valley Fair, I didn't even mention back to school, September, the, the month after the big August blowout show, and the Tennessee Valley Fair because in 1994, for the first of two years, we got a show sold to the Tennessee Valley Fair. So instead of trying to run against them, we were part of it. And they gave us $4,500 for the show, which was like, since we didn't have to advertise it, we didn't have to rent the Coliseum, we didn't have any expenses other than bringing the boys to the, to the fairgrounds and having the show, it was like drawing, you know, $8,500 at the Coliseum, and that was better than we'd done the year before with Terry Funk. And we just, I, I, they wanted girls, so we had Leilani Kai work with Susan Green. And then me and Killer Kyle had a handicap match against Bullet Bob. Brian Lee and Chris Candido in a grudge match. Dirty White Boy and Bruiser for the, Bruiser Bedlam for the Smoky Mountain title. And the Rock and Roll Express and the Gangstas for the Smoky Mountain tag title. And because that was unfortunately... 
I had I had gotten that far ahead with what I had plotted out when Jericho broke his arm and I had to change the thrill seekers out and that changed it because originally it was going to be the rock and roll and the gangsters, but the thrill seekers against Candido and potentially a, a partner to be named for the tag team title. And that would end up turning into Boo Bradley. But nevertheless, wow, those would have really been interesting matches. Storm and Jericho in 94 against Candido and future balls Mahoney. I mean, he was wrestling a different style as Boo Bradley, obviously. But uh, but unfortunately, Jericho decided to fucking practice his backflips and screwed the whole thing up. But yeah, I'd, I'd had a, uh, as a matter of fact, I went to Atlanta as a matter of, yes, September 12th, I went to Atlanta. I was there the 12th and the 13th and the 14th because um, not only did I take a little break at that point in time, but also that's when I went down and talked to Ole and shot the interviews with Bryant Anderson, his son. You mean, that's, Bryant, you mean that's when Ole got fired? Yes. And that's when I wiped the booger on Bischoff's uh, Corvette windshield. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I went down and shot those interviews because then he started, uh, I believe, at the... Uh, did I have him start at TV or was he at house shows? He started the house shows uh, on October 1st, Bryant did. Tracy and Bryant Anderson. And then Ole made the TV on October 3rd in Morganton, North Carolina. Let, actually, here's the uh, lineup I had in, on TV in Morganton, North Carolina. Ole Anderson, Bob Armstrong, Ron Wright, Les Thatcher, Jim Ross, Cactus Jack, Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson, New Jack and Mustafa, The Gangsters, Dirty White Boy, Lance Storm, Brian Lee, Boo Bradley, who would later become, as you mentioned, Balls Mahoney, Sonny, Tammy Fitch, Tracy Smothers, Bryant Anderson, did I mention Bruiser Bedlam, uh, Sean Casey, George South, and uh, a variety of job guys. Not bad for Morganton at the rec center. Did the Hardys work there as a job guys? Then? Um, You know what? They, based, based on where it was? I think they, that may be the taping. Yeah, either that one or we did. It was a North Carolina TV. I'm flipping through my fucking book now. We were in Morganton a couple of times, and we also did TV in Lenore. It may have been there. But nevertheless, uh, so two, three days in Atlanta, dealing with Ole, shooting interviews with Bryant, came back and did the Tennessee Valley Fair on September 16th. And then in, on the 17th, I was in Barberville, Kentucky at the Knox Central High School. Tickets, by the way, were available at the Marathon Pit Stop and the Chestnut Tax Service because Dennis Chestnut was our local sponsor and he could get anything done up there. And uh, that's where I spent my birthday on in 1994. And one more, just for shits and grins, because I, I see after that, in in the WWF, I was not on the road doing house shows. It was TV and pay per view and working in the office. So, and most of the time, you know, uh, uh, the schedule in the modern era has modified where people don't run weeknights as many times anymore. So, either I wasn't really working on my birthday or. I was only behind the scenes or whatever, but, and then in OVW, I became available to, or became able to take my birthday off, but I like this one that I took off because, hold on, what is it? The date of, yes, I took off September 17th, 2003. I noted that I picked up a rental car on Friday and my vacation started on Saturday the 13th. And I'm pretty sure that that's one of the times that Stace and I went up to the Poconos. But nevertheless, because it was a small operation, I was not only the booker in OVW, but also the lead announcer. If I wasn't there, they couldn't do TV on camera. And if Danny Davis wasn't there, they couldn't do TV off camera. So once a year, either I would take off or he would take off, and then we'd try to have two weeks break 
at uh, at Christmas. But in this case, we did a best of OBW television show to air on September 20th because we normally would have taped on the 17th. And the best of show while I was out of town on WBKI did a 1.7 rating and a 3.4 share with the highest quarter being a 2.2. While the, remember the WWE, what did they call their last syndicated program? WWE mental or jacked or metal. Or yeah, I'm not sure. Fucking aggravate. I've got it here. I used to write the whole fucking title, but then I just I started keeping track because the WWE syndication was on a different station on the same day, Saturday. They were 11 in the morning. We were 11 at night. So I would keep track of what they were doing. And the same day that we did a 1.7 rating and a 3.4 share with the highest quarter being a 2.2, they did a 1.0 rating and a 2.5 share with their highest quarter being a 1.1. So fuck them. And that was 2003. That was my birthday present. We beat their ratings. But otherwise, Whoa. that's a tour through some of my past, my checkered past. A deep dive into the birthday history of Jim Cornette. You sound bored. I told you it was going to go my way today. I didn't say I was bored, and again, it's your show. It always goes your way on your show. Well, you know where we're going now? No. To a commercial timeout. We are in the future, obviously. You know, the time travel, not only does the trip take longer each time, I could probably beat it in my expedition here pretty soon, but also that sounded like we were time traveling with the Blue Man group. Oh, you see, I know who they are. I know what they look like. I'm not familiar with their actual music. That's what their music sounds like? That's, that's approximately it. Give, give or take a thump thump and a squeak squeak or two. Have you seen them live? Um, why did, why did I see them live somewhere? <laughs> I'm I, yes, I have. And now I'm trying to remember how it happened. Uh, we'll come back to that. But anyway, we've come back to this. It's, it's, it's come to this now. We know we're going to finish the program finally after our various, uh, fits and starts and interruptions we've traveled into the future even though we're still talking about the past because before we let everybody quietly file out in a single file manner keeping it orderly nobody can panic but when before you leave the program we're going to catch you up briefly on the wwe happenings of the past week but i'm not going to go into very much more detail on raw since it's been a week ago than I did the AEW programs, but I wanted to recognize a couple of things, good and bad, just so nobody can say that, you know, we, we got it on the record, because we are the podcast of record, and, and so many things happened last week. You didn't watch Raw at all, and I had... Uh, That's not confirmed. Well, I don't think you did, because you kept, well, what happened? Or is it just that it's blurred in your memory now? It's like a week ago almost, and yeah. also... This has happened when we've recorded the day after Raw. I tell you, Jim, I don't know what I'm going to do. I only watched like one segment, and then it turned out I watched the whole show and didn't even realize it. I was doing other things, and it's such a slow pace. You can kind of, <laughs> you know, go to the next room, come back, and I'm missing much. Well, that's the thing. It was September 11th, the last Monday night, and that's what I was going to remark about the first half hour of the program. Without going into granular detail... Jey Uso's on Raw now, we know that much, and he's happy to be there, but Kevin Owens is still pissed at him. He said, you got a long way to go to earn my trust and everybody's trust. And about that time, here came the Judgment Day, and of course, they're pissed that Sammy wasn't there for their match tonight with Sammy and Kevin, but, well, Kevin says, hey, I'll fight all of you. It doesn't matter to me. Well, there's Jay standing there, so Jay says, hey, I'll earn your trust. I'm here too. And he puts himself in the match and Owens reluctantly agrees. And they have a 15 second fight and throw the heels to the floor. And they go to the break. We're already 15 minutes into the program. 
we come back to actually have the match that wink wink nod nod was allegedly just organically made just moments ago even though everybody was in the right place to do it and they they start the match and they go three minutes and go to a break again it was a three minute segment but then when they come back boom 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 all the stuff and of course jay accidentally super kicks kevin so he ain't happy about that and the the judgment day wins in another five minutes or so and by the time that owens and uso have had their golly i'm sorry well fuck you to walk off and then yell at each other in the back we were 38 minutes into the program but it took four times longer to set it up and react to it than it did to actually have the fucking match. I confirm I didn't see any of this. And that's the, that was, and none of those things were inherently bad besides it was just done complete like every week. Hey, let's argue. Hey, let's have a match. Let's have almost none of the match on the air and then let's talk about it for a few minutes. The same people, almost 40 minutes in an hour wrestling program, they'd have been the whole show. Can you imagine if they treated the promos the way they treat the wrestling on the wrestling show? We're just in the middle of the promo, they go to a commercial? Yeah, it... it it's nonstop. You can't get into any matches on this show. Unless it's a commercial-free hour. And then, uh, well... <laughs> and though the only reason that they're doing that... In some cases, because they got something going on on the other channel and people are flipping back and forth. To, and never mind. But Gunther's in-ring celebration. You missed that. He was celebrating and he had the big columns in the ring and the, the whole set dressing and the ominous music and intro by his stooge Kaiser Wilhelm. And if Gunther wasn't the size he is, and the height and the weight, he would be Dick York's twin brother. He comes out in a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie. He's, he's got the... It, it's not a nerd face, but it is, but not on that body. He looks like a narc or a U-boat captain or all the things that you wouldn't fucking like, right? Dick York. And Dick York. And then he, he opens his mouth and his first sentence is in German. And it, it just so... It, Again, what a great heel for any era. Was Dick Sargent the original fake diesel? Yes. Now that you put it that way. <laughs> I agree with I agree with you. I see what you did there. But anyway, so the as soon as he starts talking, he said the, you know, he knocks all of the legends, he's the greatest, and he's running out of competition. Shoosh music. And now when Gable comes out, he's still got the music and he's still got the fat guy and the girl with him. But he's doing a promo now as a sympathetic baby face, right? And Gunther says, well, you got something to say to me. Come in and say it to my face. And Chad's doing, he's doing a good job remembering the material, but it was an element of memorized recitation and he needs a little more emotion and inflection because it was, it was flowery verbiage that they had written for him and given him about how Gunther made his kids cry and lit a fire under him. But if he could have told that in his own real words, it was a great story. But I've, apparently either he can't do that or they insist on you've got to read this fucking pablum so, but then, I don't know what to think because Chad Gable, the new babyface, swore to God on television that he's going to win that title and make his daughter smile. And that means that they're either going to have Gable beat Gunther for the Intercontinental title or they they violated every rule of professional wrestling history for the last 125 years and he's going to look like a complete dick which one are you betting on i mean they seem to be setting it up so he has to win because unless he loses and it turns him into like a nutcase or something which is a part of a bigger bad angle <laughs> unless it causes something like that he has a mental breakdown he kind of has to win and you know, maybe it is time for Gunther to get past the Intercontinental title. 
There's a but, reason why so many of the great, well, before titles started changing hands rapidly, you hold the Intercontinental title a year, give or take, and you move on to the bigger and better things. Well, yes, in the in the previous generations, when the here's the problem: they're so lacking in top talent, which is why CM Punk is, you know, as we talked about, the only free agent on the market that would make a difference in that company. I know that we now we've been told that Baron Corbin once beat Roman Reigns, which would, you know, short circuit everybody's brain cells if it happened now. But how long will it be before we're able to forget if Gunther and fucking Brock Lesnar are goddamn going at each other? And yeah, the only person to beat Gunther in the last fucking however many years is Chad Gable. Again, if it comes out of this and they change the way he's being used, where he still has some of the stupid Vince McMahon elements, but he's treated like a serious wrestler, talk seriously, you see him out there with his crying family. If this is the beginning <laughs> of a new way they're going to use him, and it lasts a little while, then you don't even think about it. You just move on, and Guther's doing something else. You're not going to be like, oh, Guther, I can't take him serious against Brock because Chad Gable beat him. I think if Chad Gable's still used right, no one's going to care. Yeah, we'll see. And the best part of the show was Cody coming out to do potentially the quickest promo ever. Uh, basically just so that he could hit crossroads on twice on Dominic, which everybody always enjoys. Uh, and that only took four minutes from start to finish. Cody to come out, Dominic and JD Funko to come out and uh, to get dropped on their heads. And see, I was skipping like a half an hour at a time in between these various things I'm talking about. That way the show was more palatable. And they had a six-man with Imperium against Chad Gable, Fat Otis, and Tommaso Ciampa. And Gable tapped out Leonardo da Vinci with the ankle lock. And then I skipped about another 15 minutes, and the main event was Rhea Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez for the women's title. And remember, they had a match here. Where was it? Was it payback that was kind of disappointing, not... Not what I thought it might be, but it didn't stink or anything. That was payback, yeah. Well, they paid us back because this was a good match. It was a struggle. They're physical. They're they're working, whether they could be men or women, they're working a good, stiff contest. Um, Raquel Gonzalez worked a better bear hug than I've seen in years and years. But, the, you know, Ripley, the missile drop kick off the top and cannonball on the floor. And she gets heat. She's got a great heel attitude. But then Raquel was, was just more into this also. So I enjoyed the match, right? And, so, and boy, as Rhea Ripley couldn't, couldn't put her away toward the end of it, her facials were great. And then finally she had a big sprog, sprog flash. She hit a big frog splash and got a two count. And they went to the floor and Raquel got her up and hit her with a power bomb on the apron. And I'm like, wow, this is good. And then suddenly, you've heard about it, I'm sure. Here comes Nia Jax. She's back. The Jax attack. Nia Jax. Whatever. The last and hire of Vince McMahon. She she basically pulls Raquel back out of the ring and gives her a Samoan drop on the floor. And I'm like, what the fuck? Because I know, I think she just came back not long ago from being injured, right? Oh, Raquel Gonza, she was out for a little while. So yeah. they decide the first thing they're going to do is Nia Jax with the great track record is going to give her a Samoan drop on the floor. Boom. So that puts her out. Uh, well, no, it didn't. Because then, after she gives her a Samoan drop on the fucking floor, Raquel gets back up and crawls back in the ring so that Rhea can hit her finish on her in the ring. One, two, three. And now she's out. And then Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax have a face-off. And 
Jack's head butts her and then leg drops her on the apron and then takes her over. And remember how Yokozuna used to do the bonsai drops to the job guys? I remember, yeah. That's what she did. She gave her a shoot bonsai drop. The camera didn't catch all of the massive ass landing on the victim because they were there at a close-up and as she went down, but not only did she let go of the top rope, but also when they panned down, her, the bottom of her feet weren't on the, the, the canvas. Her heels were. And she's sitting completely on, so she kind of semi-protected her by holding onto the ropes until she got down and then she spread her legs out and let go of the rope and just fucking landed on goddamn Rhea Ripley. Their biggest female star. And that was the name of that tune. So now we not only got to suffer the fucking human refrigerator back in the ring, but she's going to assassinate half the roster in the next two weeks, apparently. Well, that was Raw, and once again, as I yeah. said, Nia Jax, uh, it is believed she is the last hire of Vince McMahon before he was the, not even the sole owner, but the majority owner of WWE. And what? Or not before he was, or the last but before one of he, but, but yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. He wants to go out, he wants to die on that hill. Or just that lump. That hole. My hole! All right, but let, let's, anyway, that was raw, and boy, it sure was. But let's go back to what everybody's talking about. Because in the same, what, 10-day period or two-week period that AEW loses their biggest name, attraction, SmackDown gives us John Cena and The Rock. Both together, and Pat McAfee. For that matter, he's got a goddamn following. I mean, is Taylor Swift next? What about fucking, you know, can they get the goddamn Super Bowl to do their halftime show? If the writers are on strike, I'm sure they can get a lot of people. But it, it's more than ever, it's kind of obvious now that, especially with the, the new ownership group or whatever, they got deep pockets and they've got access to the biggest names in the business. And I mean, for the people who didn't see the program, SmackDown from September 15th, and Pat McAfee came out. It was in Denver. They were near the building shooting something for his football job, right? What does he do for the football folks? Well, he has a podcast, but I don't know how much of a crossover audience there is between the podcast and who's going to watch wrestling to see him do whatever he does. Well, but I'm I'm saying they were nearby. He was doing his podcast or something with the the football, and that's why he had The Rock on, and they were close to SmackDown, so they got them on the show as well. There, boom. They came over and made an appearance. And who's the heel announcer now? They switch him around so much. Was it Corey Graves? Yeah. Uh, that says <laughs> McAfee had a nine-figure bank account, a double-digit IQ. That's a, that's, that's a way to... To slap a guy in the fucking face, but put him over at the same time where he can't complain. And McAfee does a hell of a babyface promo. He's glib, and he's got the gift of gab, as they say. And he put the show and the fans over and everything. Welcome to SmackDown. And then we get Austin Theory music. The guy that Brian Alvarez, uh, Uncle Dave's little delinquent nephew says needs to get with the times is interacting with pad mcafee and vince mcmahon and john cena and goddamn rock and way he better change that shit up theory he's in trouble here and this it, this was the best promo i've heard of austin theory sounding like he sh austin theory should sound like because remember we said with Cena, the thing where he was, it was like he was intimidated. He he let Cena fucking bowl over him in that. Remember, what was it? Just a couple or three months ago. Well, a little longer than that. It was WrestleMania. Was it? Well, how goddamn, how long was that? In May, June, July, August. Okay, five months ago. 
point is, he he looked like he was more comfortable here. He was more natural. He didn't sound like he was either reciting anything or like he was, you know, intimidated. He mocked and derided McAfee. Part of it may be, you know, with Theory being in the ring with Cena, I can understand that would be intimidating a young guy who's gotten a business, obviously, because he was a wrestling fan, right? McAfee's a big deal, but maybe not in Austin Theory's world to where he was as intimidated. And he's had more experience, and he's getting more comfortable. But he wasn't like a a uh, bashful young wrestling fan in the ring, like here, like he was with Cena. You, do you do you get what I'm talking? About? Do you smell what I'm cooking? I don't disagree with you. That's what I'm trying to say: is that he's progressing, he's getting more comfortable, he's doing this right, and then. You know, uh, boom, 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 McAfee says, well, you may think it's your show, but this is the people show. And the rock music hits, and the people lose their fucking minds. Just their fucking minds. And out he comes, and he just milked it. And I, what was it, five minutes? To just the entrance and the chants, and it got louder. And the response, and he's just... Without making him do anything, he's making him do everything. The Rock is the, who they didn't have any idea they were going to get for the price of their ticket, and he's the biggest star still in the wrestling business, even if he's not in the wrestling business. But I, th I think it was five minutes before he had to speak, and then there was some kind of long audio mute uh, of the crowd at, at right at that point. And then Theory tried to start berating Rock or whatever. Rock just said, shut your bitch ass up, and pff, they blew again. And he, you know, he said, apparently you don't know how this shit works here. He took his jacket off. He did finally the Rock has come back. Theory tried to do rocks it shut up you know the shut up thing it doesn't matter what you think and rock said it does matter and then he scolded him and he had the people eating out of his fucking hand and if you want to see me beat this jabroni's ass give me a hell yeah there's a nod to austin and then he just told him off and got the crowd and this couldn't obviously wasn't cleared with Fox ahead of time. And I don't know if the rock just said, fuck it. I'm going to make it up as I go along. But he had half the crowd chant your an, and the other half, the crowd chant asshole and then reversed it. And the fucking guy on the, the button is trying to mute asshole and it's just it's all over the place and you can't hear for long stretches and then you hear asshole but they bleep your end. It was so and, stupid to do it. It ruined the enjoyment of watching it when it's just mute but, the whole time. But I'm wondering, did did The Rock think that because they used to do that on USA, they can do it on Fox? Did did they not know this ahead of time? What who because it went on for a while, and if I, that's I wrote the the Rock has hijacked the Fox network. He's the he could tell have told those people now take all your clothes off and throw them in the ring on top of Austin Theory, and they would have done it. It was amazing, but the so after they got all of the muting out of the way and settled back down to it. He told Theory he was going to whip him in three seconds, and as he started counting it down, Theory suckers him, and Rock turns it around with a spine buster and gives him the people's elbow, and the place comes apart. And then McAfee does the people's elbow, and the place comes apart. And then, and I mean, it was 20 minutes long, and it was almost too quick, except for the, I would have loved to have heard the unheralded, or un- censored audio but goddamn, it's it's like rock just said i'm just gonna do a 30 minute fucking show out here for everybody and he could ran the whole fucking thing he's amazing the rock is so lame 
Oh, come on. But there on. are very few words to describe how lame he is. What? And how what? he is so lame. He's out there because there's a writer's strike. I'm sure that didn't stop one of his little stooges like Gewurz writing every word that he went out there to say. Because we've seen before, The Rock's not necessarily Mr. Improv out there. But they make theory look like that, shit. They make theory look like shit. It's one thing if you're going to take the move from The Rock. He then takes it from McAfee. McAfee's not at that level. Come on. That's ridiculous. And I know everyone likes The Rock. Well, I shouldn't say that. I know the fans there were surprised and reacting to it. But they, they, were, they were throwing him their children. No, they weren't. Oh, come on. When's the last time you heard him scream that loud for one of these schmucks that's on a show every week? It's about the surprise. If all of a sudden the Undertaker said, fuck it, I'm going to run to the ring, they would explode. Yes, because it's the Undertaker. Exactly. That doesn't mean it's good. Isn't it? That's the point of being over. It doesn't have to be good. Well, that's what I said. I'm not saying The Rock isn't over, and I'm not saying the people didn't react to it. I'm saying it was lame as fuck. I loved it because it was it was a star working people and getting them to respond. We don't see that anymore. All we see is these fucking robot part-time actors being wandered to the ring with fucking material they recite. I don't disagree with that. And actually, that is the one thing that really hit me during this, watching The Rock. And again, I'm, I think this guy's so lame. And watching a reaction. And then you think about who's the next most over guy on that show, L.A. Knight. Not counting Cena. L.A. Knight. I was about to say, <laughs> not you brought Cena. the other guy. Not counting Cena, because he's another special guest, really. He's, he's, well, he's, for... he's, he's back for a few, but back, I see where you're going. L.A. Hard Knight. Time, full time. It's the same way of talking, not necessarily above the audience, but treating yourself like a star, and then they do, as opposed to like, all these like Johnny Bashfuls that come out there. Johnny Bashful. And they get on the mic and you're like, why should I care? This guy doesn't even care enough about himself. I think that is one of the keys to LA Knight. You hear people always complain, not always, but you've heard the complaint. He's too much like a guy from the Attitude Era. If you're talking about top guys from the Attitude Era, that is the way to present yourself in this kind of setting that works. Yeah. Because nobody wants to fucking see you if you're a schmo. But anyway, speaking of schmo, before before we move on, did you uh, hear the audio of The Rock on Pat McAfee's show? I did not. Would you like to hear it? Did you hear what they talked about? I did not. They talked about what originally was going to be WrestleMania uh, in 2022, I believe. But let's uh, go to this audio. It's The Rock on the Pat McAfee oh, show. Oh, oh, okay. Now I know what you're talking about. I didn't hear it. No, but I know what you're talking about now. Go ahead. Uh, it's a few minutes, but let me see. I don't know where it starts here. That surgery, rehab, that's months and months, right? This life? was, I did triple hernia surgery, emergency hernia surgery. Stop, what's triple hernia? Holy shit, what is that? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> wow. What does that well, mean? <laughs> there's, he might tell us here in a second, but, you know, there's only, there's a different kinds of hernias. You can have an abdominal and a lower abdominal, and it can be in your midsection, or it can be down there in your crotchal area, but a triple sounds like two crotches and a fucking stomach. I don't know about that. The tearing the quad off my pelvis, I had to go shoot Hercules. Oh. So oh. I actually shot that movie Hurt. I didn't do surgery. So everything kind of just scar tissued up. And <laughs> weapon. <laughs> You're a psychic. Of all the guys looking at me crazy. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's got no, he, his knees are, he can't even walk this right. guy. I mean, it's a whole thing. <laughs> Let me fast forward past him and his friends here. I, I, that's the one thing that sucks about so many pot. It's like, here's me and all my goofy friends that sit here and agree with me. <laughs> Sucks. Hold on. Let me. Uh, yeah, I wish I had one goofy friend that would sit here and agree with me today. Come on, The Rock is lame. Hold on. Let's go back to this. Would it get back as much as like all the WWE fans have been looking for? Or? Honestly, brother, it's not. It's not the injury that I'm concerned about because that's just part of it. It's just part of the game. You sign up for it. You get hurt. We all get hurt. That's just the way it is. Um, it's not even the schedule because I could control the schedule to a large degree. It always comes that me going back to uh, WWE and wrestling a match always comes down to the reason why and what can we create. And money and lots and lots of money. That's never been done before for the fans. So that's, that was, that's the idea. Okay, which is perfect. Let's lead into last year in LA. <laughs> yeah. So far, uh -huh. Roman obviously on an incredible run. So, Jim, they're talking about WrestleMania 39, SoFi Stadium. This was the one that ended up being Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns. 
run. Yeah. The bloodline, huh? Yeah. They're not talking about my bloodline. No. no. They're not talking about Connor's <laughs> nope, bloodline. No. Definitely not. The ties, definitely not. Nope. Mm. Tones, no. AJ Hawk's bloodline runs real. You see, this is why these shows <laughs> suck, but it's just all these other people that have to Can be they included. get to the point of answering the question? Or they, asking not talking about, they were talking about uh, yeah. your bloodline. So that story was a big one. The Rock and Roman, SoFi, LA. How close? Did that ever, and was that close? All right, so The, the Rock uh, headlining WrestleMania was Roman Reigns, SoFi Stadium. Uh, that was locked. What? Oh. We were d- <laughs> No way. We, we were doing it. We, no, we, we, we were doing it. We were doing it, but let me just tell you. So uh, about in, in the beginning of 2022, um, Nick Khan, who we know, shout friend out to of ours, Nick, shout out very to good Nick. friend, Dog. long time for years. Dog. Yeah. Uh, he's the man. He was very instrumental in bringing Vince and I together. Let's stop it for a second. He said the beginning of 2022, not 2023. 2023 is the year of this WrestleMania that we're talking about. Yeah, so the beginning of 20, that makes sense because you'd want a year to know you were going to have that. Well, remember, we even said it. I mean, I said it saying, I hope they don't end the bloodline with The Rock being the one to defeat Roman Reigns. It seemed like for a long time, that's where things were leading. The idea of who can stop the leader of the bloodline, The Rock, who's technically a member of the bloodline. Yeah. Actually, it's completely different blood. It's a different family, but... It's interesting, the timeline now, because Cody was the beginning of 2023, but let's go back to this. We all flew to L.A., we met, we sat. This is the beginning in 2022, and we broke out <laughs> the Mana, we toasted life, yeah, toasted yeah. the business we love, and about an hour later, we started talking about the potential of what this match could be between yeah. myself and Roman Reigns headlining WrestleMania at SoFi. And... We shook hands and we hugged right there, all three of us at the table and said, let's do this. And so the North Star though, so then we had a year Mm -hmm. to really think about this. So the North Star thought was, okay, let's not do something good, let's not do something great, let's do something unprecedented. And it was in what can we create for the fans that has never been done before. A match, great. Roman, incredible athlete, he's gonna be on Mount Rushmore. Super handsome. Super handsome, good. This is so interesting to think about because, you know, one of the big complaints about Vince, and it's true, is that especially in later years, it seemed like everything was kind of short-term, book on the fly. Things change. Vince rewrote the show. When you think about Hogan versus Savage, that was over a year of buildup. They knew what that main event for WrestleMania Five was going to be when they went to WrestleMania Four. It's interesting hearing that Vince is still doing that here with The Rock. Well, and and Rock and Cena. Yeah, that's true. They had the deal for both before they announced the first. Good dude, my cousin, family, it's amazing. We can have the match, but the bigger thought was, what can we do for the fans in this business that we love that will, uh, where, where WrestleMania isn't the end of something, it's actually the beginning of something bigger. Got it. So. So what happened? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we got really, really close, but we couldn't actually... Yeah nail what that thing was so we decided to put our pencils down and then we agreed hey listen there's uh there is a merger coming up eventually that will happen there's wrestlemania in philadelphia there's a merger coming up they'll pay me more than i'm worth and then there's wrestlemania in philadelphia i guess wrestlemania 40 actually if you're gonna have the rock come back Right? WrestleMania 40? Right. That's a big one. Well, here's just trying to crawl into people's heads without knowing what the conversation was and just what I'm hearing here. I'm wondering if they didn't realize that they shouldn't beat Roman at that point well before it got to the point where they would have to pull the trigger on the thing. And The Rock now is is saying that we want something unprecedented, something's never been done before or whatever, to build up the potential of a future match that they may or may not have agreed to in Philadelphia because they just put it off for a year because it wasn't the time. They didn't do it with Cody either, and the bloodline has continued, and blah, blah, blah. So he couldn't. Rock would not come out and say, well, 
it wasn't a time to beat him and nobody wants to see me lose. So we put it off for a year. So he's kind of saying we couldn't come up with the thing, but there's always next time. And we want to do a, the biggest thing ever done when we do it. So he's still promoting the concept, the idea of a match. And he doesn't have to say, well, yeah, I just, you know, he's giving away the finish or whatever. If he says something to that effect. You see where I'm going with this? I do. And the other interesting thing is thinking about the whole Cody angle of it. Cody didn't win the belt. Everyone thought he would. If you think The Rock could possibly come back the next year for WrestleMania, why? I guess that is a reason not to take the belt off Roman. Because the whole idea of The Rock, he has to be the one to stop Roman if they're going to do that. But here's the thing. The Rock ain't going to win the belt. Well, that's the other thing I was going to say. If Roman's going to beat The Rock, and if Roman's going to be around, and that's questionable, he should, then it makes the person who beats Roman bigger. But if it goes the other way around, it doesn't really help anyone. Well, I don't, I don't think you want to beat The Rock. I mean, it, it, conventional wisdom in the wrestling business would be that the, the, you know, the past star puts the future star over, but that was when guys were still kind of in the business instead of a guy, the biggest star ever in the business coming back for after five years or six years or seven years, however long it's been since he's had a match to fucking do this big main event at WrestleMania and the heel goes over. I know. So I think it, it has to be something about family, the bloodline, the, the, the family, uh, settling it amongst themselves with a chosen, you know, a representative, The Rock, instead of over the title because The Rock ain't going to come back and fucking lose it. That would be insane. Well, that's the other thing, too, just based on his age and the way he trains, which is very different than training to be an active wrestler, and the previous injuries he had coming out of his match, you have to think more than likely he will come out of this match needing having some sort of injury just based on all those intangibles. Well, don't don't burn the bread on him already as Bobby Eaton Cuz he's going to work but, a physical match. I don't think well, the Rock would go out there and dog this? it. Do you think do you think that Cody finally gets his match against Roman at fucking the Royal Rumble and the Rock is there to police the maybe even as a surprise. I, I'm saying don't kayfabe the biggest star in the world, but maybe he just comes out to stop the blo evil bloodline members from doing something. Cody wins the title, but now it's Roman and Rock one-on-one -on -one to oh, restore the dynasty. That's interesting. So you don't think, again, we're just fantasy, but you don't think the Rock needs to be the first one to beat Roman in years? Yeah, not, if he's in, not if he's involved because it's still going to fucking draw. But Rock can't win the title, so it can't be for the title unless they're going to beat The Rock, which okay. I think is fucking crazy. So how's this for WrestleMania? Main event, Rock versus Roman Reigns. Bloodline dissolves if Roman loses, whatever you want to do. Second main event, world champion Cody Rhodes versus the winner of the Royal Rumble, CM Punk. Oh, boy. Then, then you got something then, that doesn't make you feel like you're losing something because Roman's not involved. Boom. Then you've got a double you got a double main event, one night for each night of WrestleMania. All right. Well, Nick Khan, if you and Ari Emanuel are listening, I'm looking for work. If you guys know Colin Thompson. We're not looking for work. We're just just send us a check for what we just did for you. <laughs> well, let's go back to SmackDown. Back to SmackDown real quick. AJ wrestled Finn and Finn beat him. Jimmy Uso distracted AJ. Um, they had a, a pre-tape in the back with Rock and Cena. You had the big hug and the handshake and everything. Again, you know, if somebody's just going to, I'll check and see what's on SmackDown. And they turn over, they see The Rock and John Cena talking to each other. The fuck? What are your thoughts on using The Rock as a surprise? Even though, from what I understand, it did, I, have, I could probably pull it up, it did really well in the ratings. But it was a surprise, so there was no real advantage to... No one was tuning in thinking he'll be there. Right, well, and, and they probably didn't know ahead of time either to advertise it, or they would have. But the point is, now they put in people's mind... If we better watch who knows what's going to happen or who's going to show up like the old days. Now you can't Haman them. Like when he, you know, had a surprise every month at the ECW arena until they were 
looking for surprises and the people expected them. But every once in a while, something like that happens. It makes people say, oh, shit, I wonder who's going to be on tonight. The people that are not living on the Internet, which are, you know, it, it, some element of people. So then apparently the I'm skipping some other things that weren't interesting, but apparently the opening segment with The Rock ran so long and they didn't take a commercial break in that for over 20 minutes. They had <laughs> they had fucking Lashley and the Prophets and Rey Mysterio and the LWO do a quick promo and go to a break and come back with the match underway and the Street Profits beat them in one minute. And then they beat up Ray and the LWO and left them laying. So they Did you see the like, promo? I, I didn't care to listen. What was it? What happened? Well, the LWO were out there, uh, you know, celebrating and talking to each other. And then Escobar, very kindly in a suit, says, you know, it has always been my dream to challenge you, Ray, for a championship. And says it very respectful. Ray gets, like, upset. And then says, oh, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. So he's not really upset, but they're teasing. Again, it's, uh. a, it's a long tease, but something, you know, why would Escobar just all of a sudden want to have that match? But then they're going back to going against the other heels, so they're putting it to the side. Something's up. Something's going to happen. Well, in the meantime, our boy, with everybody saying it, L.A. Knight, uh, another match with The Miz. This, and I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying The Miz. Who could have ever thunk it? Uh, because, again, he's working with L.A. Knight, and they can both work. Miz still looks visually... <laughs> but they have wrestling matches. It's nice pace. They're doing nice spots. They're executing them properly. You know, L.A. had one place slipped on a drop behind and picked it right up. And they gave them time so you could actually see something. They didn't go to the break till five minutes in. And uh, did you hear Michael Cole correcting English boy on how to pitch to a break without pitching to a break like they like? No, I did not hear that. Because the last thing that English boy said was, some, will Miz get his revenge here tonight? And Michael Cole jumped right in. I think the bigger question to ask is, can L.A. Knight come back from this whatever the fuck? You don't, you don't go. First of all, I hate it when they pitch to a break and don't say, we'll be right back. Or, you know, we've got to take a break or whatever. It just, but Vince, for whatever reason, likes that. But you don't go to break asking the question if the heel is going to prosper. You asked ask the question is, can the baby face overcome? And so he was schooling him on the air there. Anyway, they came back and had the rest of the nice match. Come back, yeah, kicks, knee, the whole nine yards back and forth. And then finally, L.A. hits the hot shot on Miz and hits his finish. One, two, three. Ten minutes of it was on the air. It was a good match. But again, L.A. Knight gets over without any funny business. And then he cuts the promo in the ring where he says he's coming for gold, whoever has it, Rey Mysterio, Gunther, Seth, Roman, whatever, it's L.A. Knight's game. So these, are, these segments are now, they're all built to let L.A. Knight wrestle, which is what he's good at, and talk, which is what gets him over. So they finally figured it out. I can't add anything to that. I agree, and I like The Miz. And I think I'm glad that you're giving him a chance here because I think he, in a lot of ways, is, despite the goofiness, in a lot of ways, he's the most traditional heel there. I guess it's come to this, then, <laughs> that The Miz is the most traditional. In some ways. In some ways. And then, finally, our main event of the evening. We get to see John Cena, but we have to suffer Grayson Waller at the same time. Because he's on the Grayson Waller effect. And I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you at the start, I would have been pissed about this whole thing if it wasn't that Cena is back for how many multiple weeks they said through he's going to India and all that stuff. Because he didn't, he did, he didn't speak. He did almost nothing here. And they're still trying to get Waller over. Do you see Waller ever getting over? 
or just getting it more annoying. I personally, this- yeah, I personally see him as annoying. I, I fear that he will get over it because of shoving him down everyone's throat. It's you can't avoid him on this show now. Well, they did the entrance for Cena, and again, huge ovation. Chance it would have blown the rest of the show to shame, except for The Rock, who got a bigger one. But when by the time he sat down, they had nine minutes on the air, and Waller talked and did the deal where he knocks Cena's pay per view hosting and kept interrupting him, and you know the fake insincerity, the delusional egotism, the boringness of Grayson Waller. And then finally, Cena takes off his hat and shirt and is like he's ready to fight, so Waller's going to let him speak. And then suddenly, Uso music plays, and here comes Jimmy. And now Jimmy and John have the face-off. And Jimmy snatches John's microphone away before he can speak again and says, nobody wants to see you here, John. They came to see me. And he dares Cena to either embarrass him or get the hell out of his ring because he's trying to earn his way back in the bloodline. He says he's in it, but he can't get Solo and Paul and Roman to say he's in it. So as he dares Cena to get out of his ring, Solo's music plays. And he comes out and has a face-off with Cena. And suddenly, he snatches Jimmy and goes for the spike on Jimmy, but that's a sucker so that he can super kick Cena behind him. Boom. And then Solo gets on Cena, and AJ comes out and gets on Uso, and Je- Cena comes back on Solo, and then Jimmy. And then the heels bail out of the ring, and that was it. And Cena never said a fucking word. So I'm glad he's coming back. Because elsewise, I'd be pissed. Yeah, I don't get the Waller stuff because he comes across fake and annoying. He didn't really have an impressive physique, you know, in there with the other guys he was in there with when we saw him in a tag match a few weeks ago. He looks like some clown from TMZ that they got to be a celebrity interviewer that doesn't know wrestling, doesn't really know how to interview, and looks like shit compared to the talent. That's just my opinion, right off the top of my head. And with Cena, they're going to get the most out of the least. He didn't have to say anything. Especially on the show with The Rock. He didn't have to say anything. <laughs> and I guess they're going to now set up, or well, they're kind of showing you the idea of Cena and AJ against at least Solo, maybe Jimmy, if the uh, the bloodline will allow him back in. Because earlier in the show, what was it? Who was he talking to backstage? Oh, oh Finn wait. Bauer. And yeah. Finn Bauer's like, you should join the judgment day. Heyman's in the background. There's yes. like a flashlight on his face or whatever. So you, you can see, see him. You see him all the way in the background looking and listening. And you're like, this is ridiculous. But it works because of who's in it. But uh, I guess they're teasing that it'll be uh, Solo and Jimmy versus AJ and Cena. I'm glad they got AJ away from the OC. They they take all the energy away from him. Yeah, and um, what are they doing now? Not that I'm complaining. But probably, yeah, probably getting probably getting of, their their tweets ready for you know fuck WWE <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, they just kind of hang around in the back. He sees them every once in a while, but um, that's right. But that was SmackDown for September fifteenth, so it was a rocky road for Tony Khan to navigate this week because he just got a giant pebble put in his path of rating success. All right. Yeah. 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 Well, so we, what are we doing next? Are we? Is that it? Was that the whole show? I think I think we've done most of it by now. All right. Well, but next is your show, right? In a couple of days. Next is my show, Drive Through Episode Five Hundred. In a few days. No, we haven't done five hundred drive throughs. No, no, no. Actually, you may have, because remember, you used to do the old half hour installment way back. Well, you can only hear that if you got our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash cornet. Good reminder there, $5 a month. Get access to the archive. Jim, before we wrap things up, as we are recording, Courtside Group Incorporated, a.k.a. Podcast One, P-O-D-C, on NASDAQ, $2.54 a share. Ouch! But let's look on the bright side. They are five cents off the all-time low. Hey, so they got that going for them. They may be able to get it today if they play their cards right. If you take five cents and you and you 
times 10 million, you'd have some serious money. If it goes any lower, I'm going to give people more. <laughs> well, we will keep following this story in the weeks ahead. Yes, the, the Wall Street Report is brought to you by... All righty, folks. Well, we're done here. We'll be back in a couple of days. Listen to us in all the usual places. And until then, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.